How are you doing today? Doing well, thank you. Yes, yes. No Yeah. real complaints. How about you? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm, you know, a little anxious if I'm going to be honest with you. Why is that? Because I don't know exactly how we're going to have this conversation or what it's about, but I obviously have that, like, I emailed you about it, like, that anxiety of, like, when you make content about people you like, and then you sound very critical, and I felt like I sounded very harsh, but I wanted you to know how much I adore you, and then you emailed me, and I was like, okay, I think we're okay. <laughs> Yes, we're okay. We are okay. Listen, to be my friend, you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I really appreciate it when people are completely honest with me because I'm a diehard realist. So I, I appreciate that greatly. Of course, when I watched it first, I mean, I was watching it live because Mm. Oh, I, I do watch you most days, thank most you. evenings. It's sort of like what I do. Um, so I am always there. I, I always... I know people in your community, okay? Um, so I was watching it and I was like, damn, that bitch, um, you know? And I did. <laughs> but then, you know, it's fine. I think that's just, that was how I felt at first. But then I watched it again and I watched it again and I watched it again. And it was, it was fine. And I was like, you know, she makes valid points very valid points of course i don't agree with everything and we Sure. can talk about that Yeah. but um definitely valid points and i think definitely some hard truths that not i haven't just heard from you but from my therapist i do Mm. actually have a therapist Let, mind let's you go. uh, i have for seven years so Let's go. you Pro know therapy. Let's go. That's great. Okay. We love that. <laughs> but um yes yeah so it's been it's been an interesting journey sort of seeing that reaction from you but yes um Yeah. of course we are still friends um in my opinion at least so Yes. yeah Yes. No, and I know it must be so weird because I, I know I'm a content creator too. Like I get my feelings feel a certain way when I watch people like either misunderstand me or take me out of context. And I think that's what I'm going to feel the most concerned about is like if I made you feel that way, like please correct me so I'm back within the right context um, because that's the last thing I would want to do to somebody that I really do like. Um, though everything I said I felt like was within reason. I also am just an observer. I'm not in your mind. So I know Exactly. I, I could be very wrong and I would love to be corrected on those things, you know? So Mm um, I guess I am curious um, after you watched it a few times, <laughs> what did you think that I got like very wrong and you'd like to correct? -hmm. Well, I think the things that you got wrong were not that you got it wrong because you had all the information. I, I think it's because you inevitably don't have the information and that's not your fault. That's because I don't share a lot online. I'm very much a person who distinguishes between the virtual world and like the real world. And I like to sort of keep my real life sacred. I know that that's not, I get the impression that you're far more about sort of the internet being like a part of the world more so than I am. Like you, for instance, were willing to find your husband online. Oh, yeah. I would never do that. Um, the idea of, I think you said this in, uh, your reaction to me that's sort of the internet like you know i've got the whole internet i can find like a girlfriend on the internet and things like that and that is like whoa no um Interesting. that's Yeah. completely sort of not something that i would do um just based on previous experience of dating men who's known me from the internet Mm. Sure, sure. and that's just not going well Yeah, um yeah, yeah. so yeah i think the things that i I say the things that I was most sort of visceral about in response when I was watching it live um, were the things that you were saying about my experiences dating as a black woman, not because I think that because you're white, you can't talk about black women or anything like that. I, I don't Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah care of for course that too much. yeah But um, I think more so sort of, I think there was maybe a cultural difference and sort of what it is to date a, a black woman in the UK relative to in the US. for sure I sort of got that there was a bit of a misconception about what living in rural UK means. Um, also the assumption that I've sort of moved to a rural area and I'm expecting to find love here, that I don't sort of, for instance, travel into cities every week to like meet people and like immerse myself in like that sort of culture which is very different to where I live For sure. um I think also this assumption that I get advice from reddit as well Mm um -hmm. I think Yeah. that <laughs> that um was interesting um 
And I think also the things that were said about like my trauma and mm. I think a, a lot of being a sort of Debbie Downer, as somebody called me, um, that for me felt more like how people say to me that they hope that I vote for a political party that's in my interest. It's not because they actually care about me exactly or care about, for instance, my trauma exactly mm. it's more so that they just don't want to acknowledge that that's sort of a reality that doesn't fit into their cookie cutter world of how the world ought to look of how realities that differ to theirs ought to look mm -hmm. um and so i found that a bit a bit disconcerting to sort of see um and read but yeah just general things um yeah and yeah i say one last thing sorry this is a whole list of things I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I think um, another thing um, was, I think it was sort of, um, you were relating what I was saying to sort of um, the video that I made on BreadTube and how yeah. I feel that your opinion on me wanting to be validated by the bread tuber or cornbread tuber crowd, I don't think that's a right assessment. I don't want to. I have no interest in being validated by them whatsoever. My issue with them is that they find validation in pointing to me and others like me and saying that we're not good enough black people, that it's okay and perfectly valid to bully us, to shame us for not being like what they think, which is ultimately at its root, this sort of black supremacist idea. And that therefore, we can be ostracized and we can be deemed not good enough black people mm -hmm. and that validates their existence that's sort of my own my real problem with cornbread tube as it were or the fd signifiers of the world so yeah i'd say that those were sort of my general issues yeah, yeah. i mean i think a lot of that makes so much sense to me this is this is where i would love to discuss it with you in terms of like exploring the idea of like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so fascinated that you don't use the internet for dating <laughs> because my brain is like, that tool has been so helpful to me, but that makes so much sense that it might not be helpful to you. Um, I also mm. would not recommend dating a fan. Like, my partner was not a fan of my work. He was like, stumbled across my content because he saw me collab with somebody else and reached, like, came into mm. the community very quickly, hadn't seen more than a few of my videos, and then mm. we started talking. So it's not like I wouldn't. I don't think I'd feel comfortable dating someone that I thought was like parasocially a fan of mine. So I'm like, mm. that's not what I would recommend. Right. Um, but mm. there are lots of like, I meet peers in this community all the time that are like reasonable adults that don't treat me like a YouTuber that are more than like sane to date. But to be mm. fair, a lot of them are women. <laughs> and my husband's kind of a girl. So it kind of, you know, it counts. Um, yeah. So there's something about that. So I totally get that. But could you let's go point by point if we you don't mind like why not use the internet like what is it um what has been that experience if you don't mind sharing yeah not at all um i think my experience has been one of people being disappointed that i'm not like what i am online i think that mm -hmm. a lot of sort of being vulnerable online is sort of seen as uh is sort of idealized in a way or seen as something attractive you know it's mm. attractive that there's a girl who has trauma or something like that and you know i can fix her or something like that or if only she would meet me then it will be fine and i've gotten that sort of that's sort of been my experience of dating men who see me through my content mm. that they think that this is sort of that my trauma is sort of like a beautiful quirk um of me and that that's sort of all of me um and that isn't the case you know i'm quite capable of sort of living my life on my own doing my own thing finding sort of meaning in other avenues beyond sort of a partner and dating um i do like to date um i do quite a lot of dating but um i have found it to be very difficult for people to realize that i'm not kidology that i'm zandila Mm. And that those are two, they're the same person, but very different sides of the same person. Totally. Um, and in my real life, Zandila is the prominent person. Um, and Kidology really doesn't feature sort of integrally to how I try to project myself into the world. Um, my channel is very much a place where I'm very vulnerable, sort of, I, I sort of expose, I guess, some of my worst qualities. 
um, and worst feelings um, because I do find the internet sort of quite cathartic in that way for me to like express my feelings about something. Um, so yes, it's sort of like a, a sort of quasi therapy for me. Um, yeah. And I think that that sort of people inevitably sort of see that as being the entirety of who I am. And so the dating hasn't been good in that sense. And sort of, I made the decision like a year ago that if I meet somebody and they say, oh, I know you from YouTube and, you know, let's have a coffee, let's have dinner. Yeah. That I'm not going to do that um, yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is, I'm going to explore this, but I might j ramble a bit. Um, there's sort of like an irony where, you know, when I come to work, like I'm at work right now. And then I'm going to get mm. off work and I'm going to tell my husband about work. I'm going to tell my sister about work. I'm going to tell my family how work went. And so there's like a distinctive like difference to me. Like I am at work. But then mm. the irony is I tell the internet sometimes more than I tell my family because they're conservative and they don't want to hear a lot of it. So there are parts of me that the internet does know better than my – like my – the internet knew I was thinking about tying my tubes before my mom knew interesting because like i don't talk about reproductive rights with my parents because they're pro-life they're not they don't believe in it so mm -hmm. i wouldn't talk to my family about it first but i also think that for me tying my tube doesn't feel very personal so it feels more like an introspective journey of like one day i'm gonna wake up and do that and you know i'm waiting for that britney to show up you know she's getting closer mm -hmm. she woke up the other day and she was like we're gonna do this soon aren't we and i was like maybe and so there's something about that journey that I love to share with the internet, but like, I don't need to share it with my mom. It stresses her out. Mm -hmm. She doesn't believe in it. So in some ways, the internet knows parts of me more than my parents, but the internet doesn't know my most vulnerable, intimate sides. My family does. Mm -hmm. So what I share with the internet doesn't feel personal to me, but sometimes it's vulnerable, but it doesn't very, feel very vulnerable to me. But I've noticed that some people have given me feedback and said, like, oh, you're so vulnerable on the Internet. And I was like, am I? I think I was more in the past. But my real vulnerabilities, like, I don't really share with the Internet. I just like mm -hmm. it, it's just a part of what I think normal society thinks is vulnerability. What I mm -hmm. really think is vulnerability are like deep seated fears and trauma things that I can talk to and talk about in a vulnerable way, not in a general sense. Like, oh yes, I've been assaulted. That isn't me being vulnerable with the internet. That's me stating a fact. But to sh talk about it, to go into detail, to share those vulnerabilities, um, that's like different. That feels more intimate. So how do you define, because the version of you on the internet is a part of you. How do you define like, when is it personal and when is it, when is it vulnerable and when is it like, obviously it's a real part of you on the internet and it feels vulnerable and if i okay i'm gonna say this out loud but please it might sound insulting if you just okay it's fine it's fine because it feels as an audience member like you're sharing something vulnerable about dating it also sets a red flag off in my brain of like she wants to be rescued which is why i'm not surprised white knights go for you but I don't mean that in an insulting way. That's why I said like, oh, I wonder if this is trauma because trauma often lends us to thinking we're undateable and we signal we want to be rescued, but then we don't want to be our whole trauma. But because I only see that version of you on the internet, I thought you did want to be rescued. So is that part of you honest in some way or no? Is that like the, the like what part of that should I take literally, I think? Does that make sense? I think subconsciously, there is definitely a part of me that wants to be rescued. Like, I'd love to be rescued, but I, I'm I'm not looking for my knight on the internet. Uh, I think I'm I'm looking for that knight in sort of real life when I sort of go yeah. Yeah, that be sense. dating, for instance. Like, I'm looking for that there, you know. I'm not looking for that sort of on the internet. The internet is sort of where I try to find people who sort of may be feeling the same way and reading about their experiences sort of speaking about things that i maybe don't see other people talking about mm. but that i'm quite sure that other people do feel uh, about certain things so <sighs> i wouldn't say that that's the intended message that i'm trying to put out there but i can definitely understand why it would come across that way sure um and i can see how that may sort of subconsciously be the case even um because often when i do make those videos i am sort of signaling that i want help 
in a way, um, you know, signaling that I am quite distressed about something. Um, and I don't necessarily know exactly why I do that, aside from sort of looking for somebody to sort of, I guess, in a way, validate my feelings through expressing their feelings, which may have some kind of correlation to mine. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's the main reason. Yeah. I think it makes sense that you would want to use the internet as like an art piece and like your real life as like your dating space. Like, mm -hmm. because that, that could make sense to me. Like you go to work to express yourself and then you leave work to like do your life. Cause like yes. for some people like work isn't life in that same way. Um, does that make, does that, is that fair? Mm, yes, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then how have I, I got to ask, like, how have things changed um, in relation to coming to the realization that you're like a lesbian? Uh, <laughs> um, yes. I mean, what I was saying in that video, I definitely do feel that like it's definitely been something that it's really opened my eyes to sort of like the different experiences that I'm having um, when it comes to actually dating mm. um and i think this was sort of another problem that i had a bit with your video i yeah, i felt on. that there was sort of a conflation of dating with relationships mm, i do a lot of dating um but i don't consider myself undateable i consider myself um unrelationshipable um i think that that's something that i really resonate with more so than the dating aspect i'm pretty okay with dating i'm fine with going on dates and doing all that sort of thing speed dating has been pretty much my life for the last three months so that hasn't been a problem but i have found that it's been a very different experience speed dating woman or meeting woman going on dates with woman um than it was when i was basically exclusively dating men because mm -hmm. that was just the pool of people that showed me interest um and that I was interested in as a consequence, primarily. Um, so I wouldn't say it has been a positive experience. Um, it's definitely made me a lot more self-conscious. Uh, it's definitely fed into my already very low sort of self-image and sense of my own self-worth and value, um, which is, uh, I guess, according to some people, I guess, unusually low, but it is very low. Um, and that is just the way that it is, really. Um, and so, yes, yes, I haven't found it. I haven't found it like sort of this affirmative, wonderful thing that I've like enjoyed or sort of sort of found my, my sense of identity in. Yeah. Exactly. I think a lot of what I've experienced of I guess there's been culture in major British cities, which I travel into for like all these different events and meetups and all these sorts of things, is that sort of a lot of sort of identity is really around a lot of aspects of identity, specifically queer identity, um, which I recognize I don't fit into and I don't resonate with that identity for myself. Um, and especially being black i found that this has been a bigger issue for me than i would have expected um for instance last week i went on one speed dating event and i met the six-year-old black woman who was for me the first femme black woman that i'd met at one of these things and she said to me that in her whole life i'm the first femme black woman that she's ever met uh, in the UK. Wow. Um, and that really like sort of, uh, hit me quite hard. And I was like, yeah. oh, so I was, I was right about this being a very peculiar experience. Um, and yes, yes. So I, I have found it quite a disenchanting experience, but I think cause I'm a realist and I'm just quite curious, I will keep going to these things. I'll keep sort of doing these things. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I, I'm very, as you're absolutely right, I'm a pretty negative, pessimistic person. Mm. Um, I'm very good at disguising my negativity when I'm sort of dressed up and at an event or whatever and being incredibly positive and incredibly flirtatious and all of that. But um, 
yes, I'm not terribly hopeful. And I do often find that, I guess, I guess I wouldn't call it myself, I wouldn't call myself as pessimistic as I think I sort of may come across. I, I call myself more of a sort of um, a morbid realist about things. And I do find that often my predictions are confirmed, um, sort of about 99% of the time um, when it comes to sort of these things. Um, and just on what I've sort of observed, sort of immersing myself in this community and space. Um, yeah. Yeah. That is, I'm so fascinated by the femme experience there because like that's so mm. interesting. Like what, a, what an interesting little bubble that is. Like, I didn't mm -hmm. think about it that way. Now, I'm curious because I did get a comment on my video saying that they were also confused on why I discounted your experience as, like, a black woman. And after I explained to them my reasoning, they were like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. So I want to explain it to you, and then I want to hear your thoughts on it, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So obviously, like, my – and you know because, like, you watch my content. Like, I think, like, the world is all bubbles, and I think, like, <laughs> dating – like rules are bubble rules and so i think like saying like black women are the date like at the bottom of the dating pool is true for bubbles even black men on grinder have a harder time dating than mm -hmm. white men that is true but that's why i say like pop the bubble because that bubble is useless when finding love it's only useful when dating within the construct of the bubble um because like the real person who loves your consciousness won't care about your skin color right mm -hmm. but the person who cares about your skin color, they're operating within a dating pool mindset, which is also a bubble mindset, which is fine and fair, I guess. But it mm -hmm. means that, like, you are in competition with other people. Mm -hmm. But do you want to be in competition with other people for the love of your life? Because, like, the love of your life isn't in competition with other people mm -hmm. is how I view it. So are you looking for the love of your life or are you looking for a good relationship you can settle into? I'm looking for the love of my life. And that's one reason why I said I don't see myself being in a relationship in like the next decade. Because what I have found and what I've just seen and observed is that sort of the older people get, um, the less that sort of thing matters, the less that I find that the sort of aesthetic side of sort of queer identity matters the less important sort of how good you look all these labels of being like a stud or a chapstick lesbian or whatnot all these sorts of things the less that seems to matter mm. um and that's why i found in the uk um i haven't made friends with british people um i don't that's why i get quite annoyed when people call me british because i've yeah. always been an outsider in britain like very much so since i was at school never had friends and i found that when it comes to the closest that i've gotten to being friends with people it's sort of very much dependent on age the older they are the more likely they are to want to be friends with me and i found the same with dating even when dating men sort of the older they are the less likely they are to care about that sort of thing and that thing does in my context matter a lot because in the uk black people make up like just under three percent of the population yeah. and the black community i mean we we don't get on uh, in south africa or in britain and probably uh, based on my reception online not very well in the us either so um you know that's not a community that i've ever felt a part of or uh, have had positive experiences with when it comes to dating or just friendship even so that i think is that idea of sort of like leaving a bubble or popping a bubble is quite difficult for me to sort of conceptualize beyond that of sort of waiting or sort of living my life until I'm at a stage when I'm older, when those things don't matter as much uh, or aren't sort of as integral as I find them to be now at sort of my age and with my sort of demographic, um, at least here in the UK. So I think that's why, I think when I say that sort of, I don't expect to be in a relationship until like for the next decade, that's sort of where my mind is at when thinking about that. Yeah. Um, because I am looking for the love of my life. Um, that's sort of very much sort of my objective. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forget, how old are you? 
Uh, I turned 27 on Saturday. So. <gasps> oh my God, a Pisces? Right? A Pisces? I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know anything Guys, about astrology. Pisces, I'm so sorry. Somebody confirm, please, because I don't know. Someone confirm. <laughs> okay, exciting. Exciting. Congratulations. Happy birthday. Thank you. That's Thank exciting. You. Okay, I think that all makes sense to me. I'm I'm hearing, I'm waiting to hear one thing from your assessment, which I wonder how you feel about it, but where do values play into this? Like your values? Because right now you're describing like FD signifiers values as like one value. That's like the modern black bubble and the progressive bubble. You guys don't match in terms of values in that way. So like you guys wouldn't vibe. I wouldn't date FD signifier either. Even though I like him, I have no hate towards him sending love and peace. But like we wouldn't be compatible, right? But I had to marry someone who was very progressive, but also didn't I married somebody who came from a conservative bubble so they could have a balance of an un unknowing. Like I, mm -hmm. I read a comment that said, Kidology needs to find herself a former Catholic. And I was like, somebody who's like more conservative, but more liberal over time. Like, and I kind of vibe with that. Like I'm, you know, my husband's from a very Catholic country. It was kind of cool dating somebody who came from a conservative bubble, but is very progressive because it means I have like this really good balance. Mm -hmm. And I wondered like, um, where do values, I guess, play a role in this? Because like time does time change values? Because you're insinuating like maybe it would maybe for people in your demographic? I think it does. I think time does change values. I think uh, also just experience of more people, relationships and sort of, I think as people get older, typically they take a lot less bullshit. Mm. Um, and so I think a lot of the things that seem so integral to people, especially to their value system now, really don't feature when sort of as you get older you realize that actually a lot of what you value isn't changing the world like you're just one person sure. in this whole experience and this complexity of reality and all you really have control over is sort of you know paying your mortgage every month and like you know saving for a holiday potentially so i think um i think for me i i find that I'm, I find that I resonate with that sort of no bullshit sort of mindset. I think I resonate with that, not because I have that, because I find myself to be, I find my values to be very much informed by a lot of my insecurities, mm. which I think have a lot to do with my age, but I'm, I resonate with it because I'm very attracted to that. I'm very attracted to very confident woman. Um, I find that that really feeds something in me and really is something that I can sort of look up to and aspire to um and so I think that's where I resonate with that and yeah. I do think that with age I do think with age that women become more confident um of course not like sort of as a universal thing I mean everybody's an individual but I think generally sort of with age people become a lot more confident in themselves um without it being sort of about uh, the externalities of things yeah, um, for sure. And sort of that's what I'm hoping with age, that that is what happens with me. Um, and then I can attract the kind of woman that I'm attracted to and that I would see myself being in a long term forever relationship and partnership with. Yeah, that sounds OK. Reasonable. I think you're right on that. I mean, gosh, I feel like I didn't solidify my journey with myself until 30 and then 30 just started the next journey of getting to know all these new parts of me that I never knew. And so the journey continues forever, right? Mm. I'm always discovering new parts about myself. I actually am on the journey of seeking a diagnosis for autism or ADHD. And mm. I wondered if you were willing to share a super personal question, um, but are you neurodivergent in any way? Like, are you on the spectrum or anything like that? <clears throat> I have no idea. Uh, okay. I've never found that out or anything okay uh, okay yeah I, I wasn't know. sure because I have a theory I'm sure you've seen me say it I think everyone in this space is neurodivergent I was like why are we all <laughs> hanging out <laughs> why are we all hanging out but of course like I don't mean to put that on people I just like I get a excitement over it mostly because I'm discovering so much about myself um and I need mm. to though I'm like running into problems that I can't fix with introspection so I was like diagnosis that's the thing that's missing so um, I'm looking for the tool, but if you don't know that about yourself, I feel like that's fair. Are you assuming you probably aren't or are, or you just haven't even thought about looking into it? I think the latter mainly because I think that's where like sort of, I guess my quote unquote conservative streak comes in. Uh, I think that's sort of, 
Um, I feel like for me, it, it would sort of present itself as sort of uh, or should I say this out loud? I don't know. I feel like it would be like an excuse for me. That's the thing. Mm, yeah, yeah. And uh, I feel that that would be an excuse for, I guess, some tendencies that I may have uh, or tendencies that I think if they were uh, validated they would sort of really come to fruition. And so I, I'm, for that reason, I'd rather stick my head in the sand than deal with that, I think, personally, for me. Yeah. Um, it's not that I don't believe in mental illness, but I think I have been quite, I say personally, I've just found myself quite disconcerted with sort of the whole aestheticization around mental illness. Um, and that just, makes me feel that oh, I won't be taken seriously because people don't take these people seriously. Um, and it's sort of, I feel that it's just like a, it would just be in a bit of a spiral for me uh, personally. Yeah. So I think at this point in my life, I'm not terribly interested in finding that out. I know yeah. certain things about myself, like that I have fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, I've oh, known that since I was a child. To me and I didn't realize that. <clears throat> Yes, mm. yes. Uh, so, you know, and that's a whole thing in itself. And so I don't want to add to that list. Sure. Um, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> that's, that's sort of enough of a sort of, I guess, a, uh, a red flag. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, um, that's funny because I, uh, I already get discounted because I'm borderline, of course. And I already get, like, all my opinions will be thrown out. Because, like, oh, Brittany has borderline. So she, like, any opinion she has. Or, like, oh, Brittany's been cheated on. So any opinion she has. Or, oh, Brittany's done this. So any opinion she has. And it's, like, okay, I have to ignore all these spaces and build a safe space for my audience. Because, obviously, these things are real experiences, right? And we've mm -hmm. been covering a lot of uh, spectrum-y stuff. And there is, like, a, a desire to discount people. And, obviously, autism is uh, not a mental illness, right? It's a you're born that way processing um, experience. So, like... It also is on a spectrum. And so even people with like autistic children, like we watched the other day, Abby, Love on the Spectrum, her mom has a hard time dealing with like one, like level one autists um, because they don't struggle in the same way that her daughter does. And so it's difficult, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, have, I even have that worry too, that I'm the kind of person that like, I don't want to just seek a diagnosis to have one because like, I don't want to be that person either, right? Like that person feels like a liar to me, like to hold a diagnosis that's not appropriate, but I refuse to limit myself. And so I also don't want to be the conservative that won't take the medication because it makes them feel weak. And so I'm like, okay, Brittany, fight your conservative desire to not take the medication because it makes you feel weak and fight your desire to put a label on something because like, you know, it's a process to get labeled. Like getting a fibro diagnosed took fucking just a year, which for me felt like mm -hmm. 20 years, but the average diagnosis can take up to six years for people. So I'm really wow. lucky. It happened really fast for me, mm -hmm. you know? So I understand that. Um, I think that's a really common experience a lot of us have, especially those of us who have like, quote, pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps or feel like we've done a lot of work on ourselves. I think it can feel um, like an opportunity to make an excuse and be like, well, I have autism. So, but at the same time, how do you know? Because my worry is like, okay, if I don't allow myself to get diagnosed properly, that I'm also hurting myself in the long run. Like what if there's ways I could have been better at my job or better in my relationship or better at food? You should have seen me throw a tantrum this morning over food textures. It was a lot. <laughs> okay. It was a lot. Okay. I've been starving myself all day because like, okay, I can't. And it's like, this is, this is something. So like, how do you, how do you know you're not limiting yourself in either direction? Like how, when do you make a decision? to ask yourself that question I don't think I do ask myself that question mm. I think if I fail at something I just say that like, you know you failed at that and you need to take accountability for that failing and suffer the consequences because that's just life for sure. um that's that's what I do you know um I think you know, for instance, I was late on a deadline that I had for a sponsored video. Uh, and, you know, there were a lot of reasons that I could have really put down to sort of mental health and like things and like anxiety and all these different things and stuff like that. But it was, I said to myself, no, you've, you failed at this. So you need to just 
apologize and suffer the consequences. And if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. And that's, there's no excuse. Um, that's life. So I think that's, that's sort of, uh, probably my Pentecostal upbringing a bit. Um, but I think it does help me uh, as well, just personally, sort of be, I guess, the parent that I don't have. And that's sort of, I guess, what I see sort of <laughs> parenting <laughs> as yeah. ultimately. Um, so, yes, yes. It's not something that I necessarily deal with beyond that sort of self-reckoning and self-flagellation. Yeah. Yeah. I always say no uh, gold stars for the basics. So if I like, I also miss a deadline or I go through things and I'm like, oh girl, we did not, we failed girls, a pass or fail. But also yeah. I feel a lot in those moments. So I try to let myself feel some things. How do you feel when you don't like make a deadline? Like, how does it feel? Um, I think sometimes I just don't feel anything. Um, I, I really don't. I just sort of, I don't feel anything. I'm like, well, you've, you've messed this up. Just reckon with that fact and then just forget about it. Um, but I think mostly it's sort of just like, don't do that again. It's sort of a, a lesson. I see it as potentially a lesson. Okay, what could I have done better so that that doesn't happen in the future? Yeah. Um, so that I don't do that again, um, which works about like eight times out of 10 mm. but um yes yes i think that i think that's how i deal with it really okay that yeah. is so interesting because i'm struggling so hard with tiktok right now bro like putting up tiktok videos is like the next part of my journey because it's so good for views and i'm like <laughs> mm -hmm. like this is the extra step in my day that i'm like i have no spoons left to do this but i always tell myself like when you're ready you'll integrate it into your like habits throughout the day or like into your schedule so mm. um I feel like what you're saying is so relatable. I do feel I've allowed myself, my partner's helping me practice this, like feeling disappointed in myself, like not great, Brittany, but also like genuinely I am doing my best. So like mm -hmm. I have to recognize that I'm doing my best and my best is not where I want it to be. Do you have mm -hmm. a similar problem or thought process when you don't attain those goals? Like, do you have this? Because look, with the fibro, I'm at 70% capabilities. I'm just, I'm not. My rheumatologist told me two types of reactions to fibro. You either give up completely on life or you fight through the pain. And I refuse to give up on life, but I'm never going to be 100% again. Just like it's mm -hmm. not a reality, like unless there's some sort of like tool I haven't used yet. Mm. So I have to accept that I'm not, I'm not going to be the old Brittany I knew. So I can't actually beat myself up for it. Like, I, it's not an excuse. It's literally just a fact. And mm -hmm. I don't want to pretend that I'm just like, oh, you're being lazy. So like, be, cause like it will hurt me in the long run. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you like, what do you do in those instances? Like, I know punishing yourself, you said it works eight out of 10 times. That's great. What do you do for the other two times? What happens? Oh, yes. That's when I go to a bit of a dark place, I think. Uh, and sort of I, I start to think very sort of morbidly and rather doomeristically about things. Mm. Uh, yes. And that's not a good place to be. But usually it doesn't last terribly long. I sort of see it as sort of uh, phases more so than anything um, that I go through. Um, Is it like so a I don't burnout? tend yeah yes yeah i think that's a good way of putting it sort of okay. that's that's when i know i've sort of burnt out a bit for sure uh and i just need to sort of cocoon myself away from everything away from the world away from the internet mm -hmm. um and that can also sort of happen at different times like with different platforms as well mm -hmm. that i need to sort of leave and just find peace away from twitter is a very good example of that <laughs> The way I very briefly view Twitter every day, the way I like scroll and I'm like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm, yes, a very dark mm -mm, place indeed. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh yeah. You tweeted something the, the other day about robot girls. And I was like, I want one of those so bad, but you said it was going to destroy the world. And I was like, girl, destroy my world, girl. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> 
<laughs> I was laughing. I was like, yo, I want this doll, though. I want this doll. <laughs> I think it depends on why you want the doll. If you want the doll in order to stick it to women because women are like horrible whores who are degenerate now and are just useless, then it's going to destroy your world. Uh, mm. If you're getting it because it's a nice addition to your already healthy, meaningful relationship with your partner and you're not getting it in order to stick it to the woman, sure. then by all means, I mean, that's a very different thing, I would say. Um, Can you explore yeah. that with me? Because like, you know, these men, because I feel like these men who are like going to stick it to women by getting the doll, like they're already there. Mm -hmm. Like you're already at the point because if you're already having the thoughts, like you're already there. So like you are meant to not socialize with women. You're meant to socialize with the doll. Are you though? Isn't that just a distraction from, I think, the inevitable reality for most people which is that when you sort of have a very strongly held belief about something there's going to be something or someone that's going to sort of chip away at that at some point uh the more you try to i think alleviate yourself from that sort of thinking i think that the doll just means that you don't have that opportunity or that willpower to actually try to do things to improve your situation i think that's just falling into that I don't think that those men are already like that exactly or fully. I think the doll just cements it and validates that. Um, that Do you mean like of... born that way? Because I mean, yes, like, I don't can't... think men are born that way. Right, they're not born that way. But like, if you've already gotten to the point where like you're picking a doll over a woman, like you're already in the category of guy who picks doll over a woman. Are you though? Well, you if the doll is there. Doll. If the doll isn't there, are you going to, are you, I think that there's more, there's more opportunity and there's more of a willingness or there ought to be more of a willingness to have hope that there's going to be a woman for you rather than completely decimate any possibility of that hope when any woman finds out that you've resorted to a doll because fuck them woman. How is it, how does he, how do you like, you call yourself a realist, but like, why is it realist to think you'd be partnered? Wouldn't it be more realistic to think you wouldn't be partnered? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's about being partnered exactly. I think it is about sort of, I think like sort of partnership is sort of an offshoot of just the general thing of having respect for your fellow humanity uh, or respect for women in general, say. Um, and I think that that getting, say, that doll just decimates any possibility of that uh, being realized in your life. But if it decimates it already, then you are agreeing that they are the guys who chose the doll. So they're already in that category. Because otherwise getting the doll wouldn't decimate it. That's what I'm – I think I'm saying the same thing you're saying. Getting the doll decimates your possibility of you being a person who's going to end up with a partner. But that's okay because that's like you're, – you're that part of the populace. But it's okay when that's not actually going to fulfill the needs that you think it's going to fulfill. Well, I kind of think if you end up with a doll, finding a partner is the least of your problems. <laughs> Right. Because like yeah. then you're you're saying that like a partner would fix this, but like so many things need to be fixed before a partner even comes into your life. And then even then they might not. Yeah, I don't think a partner will fix it. Mm -hmm. But I think that ultimately I think it's about sort of like, I guess, in a way, fixing yourself. But I think this idea of sort of, I guess, fixing yourself or self-love, I think we need to consider that in relation to, you know, all self-love is ultimately based on a foundation of other people loving you and validating you. Mm. It's not like, it's not you in an, on an island by yourself. Ooh, explain that because I don't know if I believe that. I've, I, I have this argument with people a lot, actually. I don't I find myself strongly. in that category. Say that again? I believe that strongly. Yeah, tell me, tell me. Um, like, where does that come? Like, how do you, because like, I, what's the evidence for that being true? <laughs> evidence. Um... Or your lived experience, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I can answer that. Um, I think that, for instance, I'm somebody, I don't, I don't have self-love. I don't, mm. I don't have that. And sort of, I recognize that in myself relative to other people, because other people who I see with self-love sort of have found that foundation on, especially, I would say, childhood and their childhood development. They've had somebody from since they were a wee child saying that they are important, that they are valued, that they are significant, that they have opportunities in life or should you know do something with their life whether it's like do whatever you want to do or you will become a doctor because 
that is the important thing for you to do. Um, they have, I think, mainly, I would say just generally a sort of a foundation of family, of like community, like including family and people, mm -hmm. a sense of identity and purpose, which I think really is integral to you then being able to tell yourself, especially as you grow older and you leave the nest, being able to say to yourself, I am of value, I am important, um, I have a purpose, or I'm going to find my purpose, I'm going to find my way, um, you know, uh, I think that that is so integral to what I've seen of people who have self-love, that it's always that common denominator mm. of a lot of their childhood experiences, especially when it comes to their parents or parents, um, or to some kind of community that they're in, especially a religious community. Mm. Um, and I do think that for that reason, this idea of self-love is a very Western thing um, that I see very much in the West rather than in the rest of the world. Except I would say with, I would say in my experience of South Africa, I'd say that that's something more associated with um, men uh, and in sort of patriarchal societies more so with men um, that I guess they wouldn't call it self-love exactly, but sort of, I guess, a sense of self-importance. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think that that is an integral foundation to it. I've never met anybody sort of practicing this kind of self-love um, in their real personal lives or just as sort of a marketable like product of like self-care and everything. Ever being somebody who's sort of had an experience of, I don't know, like my experience day of being like fostered or yeah. something like that or yeah. um, not having sort of a parent who has to an extent really instilled that sense of them being an important person in the world i agree with you i actually i'm not gonna yeah i can't argue on that point because every like data point we have for basic like trauma or psychology data says that like your kids need to be raised in a loving solid home with a good foundation often with two parents you know regardless of gender but like i think studies do reflect that so this is why I say like it's trauma, trauma. Everything is trauma because the data shows that. So I know you're working with a therapist and all of that. That's great. So do you recognize like out loud that like that's coming from trauma, your lack of self-love? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think so. But I wouldn't say that it's just trauma by itself on an island. I think that's all. I think everything, I think like self-love, it's all very much informed by how people treat you and interact with you. Um, you know, I think a lot of my sort of issues with myself aren't just trauma. I think it is how people respond to me, um, you know, how throughout my life black people have responded to me. It hasn't, it hasn't been positive for the vast majority of cases. Um, the way that, uh, I, yeah, I'd say that that's sort of a, a main example, for instance, that's been a real issue for me and sort of I guess when it comes to like image and self image and stuff like that, finding sort of a sense of, uh, I guess, self love or uh, pride, even, uh, you know, it, for me, it's just like sort of a fact of the matter. It's just like, I can't do anything about that. So whatever. Um, but yes, yes. So I don't, I don't sort of see anything affirmative or anything that I feel sort of proud of in myself. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't resonate with me in any sort of meaningful sense. Uh, I'd be sort of deluding myself if I said that I love myself or I think I'm beautiful or whatever. Yeah. Okay, I have two thoughts. So, uh, okay, the first one is that I, I, I want a clarification on whether it's a symbiotic relationship, like you give love, they give you love back, and then that's the confirmation. Or if you're saying it only comes from the outside, because I know like having borderline, <laughs> I was super loved by my parents. My parents love the fuck out of their kids, bro. But mm -hmm. there was also a feeling of conditioning on that love. And there was mm -hmm. also a, a lesson my parents had to learn, which is like they would threaten to kick, kick us out of the house if we were like gay or had sex before marriage. And that was like a fear we all grew up with. We were like my parents would have tirades of like, you can leave my house when you turn 18. Like if you don't like my rules, which caused mm -hmm. all their kids to be incredibly individualistically like independent. Mm -hmm. And even now, like none of us really live near my parents. And those who do go home every Sunday to see my folks. And I call my mom almost like every day or we talk as much as possible, whatever. We Marco Polo. But – they get a limited version of me because they are not a completely safe space 
to be mm. completely loved fully. But mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to be a need of mine after DBT and therapy. I didn't need people to love me fully. I needed people to love me deeply, um, but not see every part of me. And then that could be like inner circle. So it it still, I still was loved and I was given that foundation, but I still needed to find self-love because nobody could give it to me. I found that nobody knew how to give it to me but me. Even more than my husband, I love him, but I don't care if he dies tomorrow, I'm not losing my sense of self-love. Like it didn't come from him. It came from me. So that feels like a symbiotic relationship, which is like they give it to you, you lose it sometime in your life when you like deviate from your plan, then you find it again within yourself, and then it becomes like you become an individual within a community. Is that what you mean? Or do you mean that you're looking for self-love to come strictly from people? Like you think it comes from people into the individual? I think a bit of both. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if like sort of one determines the other or vice versa, sort of like the debate of whether the whole makes up the part or the part the whole. Sure. Um, I think it's 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 a bit of both. I'd say that I sort of, I personally would resonate more with the former, the idea of as uh, symbiotics, as you say, uh, mm. sort of uh, self-love. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, that resonates with me personally a lot more uh, mm -hmm. sort of I definitely feed off other people and I think that I sort of lose a bit of myself when I lose people um, that's definitely been my experience uh, sort of ever since I was a child um, that's been sort of I've, I've very much depended on the validation of those in my personal life mm. um, and not necessarily validation as in you know uh, affirm me but sort of uh, that sort of I guess that unconditional love that is sort of um, that sort of very honest acceptance of sort of what I am and who I am mm -hmm. um, and letting that be and not trying to sort of change that or um, sort of treating me as lesser than because of that. Um, that's always been something that's been very important to me. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes so much sense to me. Okay, this, okay, then, okay, we agree. Okay, then that makes sense. The following into the community aspect is what I've always struggled with. I have so many videos on this and I know a lot of them have been taken down now. But I really felt abandoned by all the communities I ended up joining because they couldn't see every part of me, but not even that. They couldn't understand me. And if they didn't understand one part, it felt like they would look at me like I was a bad person because of the mm. misunderstanding. And that made me feel like so confused, which also mm. made me realize like people can't see every part of you. Um, and if they can, that's great. But I think that's really rare. My husband's the first person I've met who I felt like could see me fully. Um, mm. So I can be completely unmasked and like vulnerable around him and share my deepest, darkest thoughts, you know? But that means that I have countless videos of me saying like the gay community treated me this way or oh my God, the progressives or oh my God, the feminists or even the conservatives, like all of them have rejected me the moment I deviated from their expectation, which mm -hmm. led me to realize like I wasn't looking people as like I was looking at people as groups and not individuals. So when you like you say you have a bad relationship with like some black people, do you mean like every single black individual you've ever met or do you mean communities at large? What do you mean? No, I don't mean individuals. I, I'm very much of the impress impression that sort of I sort of see it as like sort of an analogy to sort of uh, you know when you have like a group of like when I see you everywhere a uh, sort of group of female friends, right? And when you get one of them on their own, it's perfect. Like it's mm -hmm. great. They are a lovely person, but as soon as they join the group, it just turns into like this horrible little thing that goes on, and you just can't be around it and so I sort of see that when I talk about like say the black community um individual black people um when we're away from that community I can have a great conversation with great interaction with um the problem is when that community spirit comes into uh, our one-on-one -on -one yeah. relationship say and I found that a lot with the black or I found that with all the black men that I've dated um that eventually that sort of seeps in and there's sort of that that I would say uh that sort of group think of it comes into play sure. when they realize that I'm not on the same page as them when it comes to the group uh, sort of sentimentality and sort of value system and understanding of things um and that there's certain things that you can't talk about like Oh, well, I might as well say it here. I don't really care anymore. But um, like sort of if I say that, for instance, in my experience, both in South Africa and in the UK, people who have been racist toward me have mm. been, the people who have been the most racist toward me have been 
my own people, black people. Um, and that's something that you just, I found that when I've said that to somebody who I've been dating, um, that that's just like a deal breaker um, with one guy that I was dating. That was just too much for him. So um, it's sort of like, I find that that's when for me sort of, there's that problem of sort of um, the parts and the whole uh, and sort of like the part that I'm sort of interacting with for forming a personal bond with is sort of tied to the whole. Um, and so that's what I sort of mean by sort of communities, uh, yeah. I think. I think there's definitely individuals in communities and I love interacting with those individuals. But I think I definitely have a real like aversion and sort of rather, I think in some cases, sort of antagonistic, sort of visceral like response to the communities and the community sort of tribal spirit that forms around it, um, especially when it comes and starts to affect my one on one personal life and relationships with people. Um, and I do find that that is far more the case with with people uh, with black people in my um, relationships that that happens far more often. Mm. Do you think it's like colorism or a play on like, is it just because I mean, obviously, you're explaining a thing. I think that's a lot of more individual minded people, I think, are going to run into this. I feel like even if you're in conservative bubble, the moment you're like pro choice, it's like. They look at you like, what do you do? You stepped out of line. That's how I felt my whole life. Like, oh, my God. Once I became a Republican who's pro-gay marriage, everyone looked at me like, what are you doing? You're ruining mm. it. You're ruining our relationships. You're learning, ruining our friendships. Now we can't be friends with you. Now we can't socialize with you. Or it feels very strange. So I feel like um, I am assuming with the black situation is probably more like, uh, like I guess, tribalism to like what? A country, an idea, a thought process? What is it? Like, what is it? Do you, can you share the detail? Of, like, what would be something racist that they say towards you? Like, I I get quite a few DMs of people sending me pictures of raccoons, uh, for instance. Oh, like that's, no, I, I get gonna, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah That yeah, sort yeah. of thing. Um, this yeah, idea yeah, of being yeah. a traitor, I get sure, that sure, a sure. lot from I South mean, you kind of are, to be fair. Um, don't, you, don't you think you are kind of a traitor to the group think? Well, no, because if I, I think if people were honest with themselves, they don't think like the group. But I think everybody's scared I of think, the group. I think so they, they do. Think I think they do think like the group. Ultimately, that's why they pick the group. And then the people who don't pick the groups got to form their own bubbles. I think people like groups. So I, I, I think you can see it as sort of like a religious community. Like looking at any church, I mean, I think a lot of it is like sort of that group of like when you take each individual, like – everybody's having like an affair or is like True. smoking or doing things like <laughs> sinful things things that they shouldn't do you know they're being individuals that yeah, aren't yeah, conforming yeah. with the group yeah. but they're all a part of the church they're all mm -hmm. a part of you know the tribe the cult even um they're all living by us and i think it's mainly sort of out of fear and also because there's power in numbers and because you know uh it, it sort of gives you a sense of purpose even if it isn't your real purpose or your real identity it yeah, at least yeah, yeah. is something that you can present to the world so i wouldn't say i wouldn't say that actually um mm. i do think there's a lot more individuals but that it's 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 frightening to be by yourself because then you end up like me who's self-loathing uh you don't you end up like me like... i'm alone and i'm <laughs> thriving girl <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. No, there's two versions of being alone. Because look, I, I have this whole video about this. Like, I'm not a community member. It took me a really long time to realize that. I'm not a community. I don't well play well in teams. I never did in school. I don't mm. like working with other people. I like this because this is one on one. Mm -hmm. I even am very, like, very picky about what panels I go on because I'm like, I don't want to be part of your clique. I don't want to be associated with any of you fuckers. I love you all so much. I do not want to be part of your fucking little groups. I don't want to be like, oh, Brittany's part of the clique. Because every time I try to join a, join a clique, you're right. One on one, we're great. And then all together, it's like, what the fuck is this toxic little family I'm in? I already have one. I was born into one. I don't need another one. I'm mm -hmm. good, you know. So I agree with you there. But I think the people that choose the community overall are saying they're community members. Because I literally, if I keep choosing it, I'm going to unalive myself. I cannot choose the community. I can mm -hmm. only choose like the government body that I live in. Like I'm a good Croatian temporary resident. I will follow the rules. I'm a good community member as a whole. I pay my U.S. taxes. I pay my governments. I will be a good community member in that way. 
but I am more interested in bubble hopping and visiting, but I want to be a visitor because I don't want to have to commit to the bit. I don't want to have to toe the line. I don't want to have to speak a certain way. I don't want to have to dress a certain way. I just want to come home to myself. So like I have to pick myself. Mm -hmm. The community will kill me if I do not. Not mm -hmm. because of themselves. They're not bad people, by the way. I don't mm -hmm. think, I think I'm playing to my strength versus assuming the community was even made for me. What do you think? Because you, the more you talk, Z, you mm -hmm. sound like an individual who still wants the community, but like, girl, it doesn't sound like your vibe. You keep saying you like want, love one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm. So isn't that your strength or no? Am I, I don't want to project onto you. I think I want the community, but I want the community to be honest with itself. I think that's the thing that frustrates me. Uh, I think... <sighs> Oh, do I want the community? I don't I don't know if I want the community or if it's just because it's so like sort of expected. Yes. Um, because constantly the fact that I'm not of the community is I'm just constantly like berated as like a traitor, as a coconut, as you know, somebody who isn't worthy of so, being black or whatever. Okay. You, know? <laughs> <But it's, laughs> you know. And that gets quite exhausting. And so yeah. I think that that exhaustion and just sort of that exhaustion of having to go through through that and explain that like since I was a child for sure has been just exhausting and so it's like I it would just be I wouldn't say easier but it would be far more uh I think just straightforward for me and I guess for everybody else if I was just a part of the community but then at the same time if I'm going to be a part of the community you've got to accept that I'm not exactly like you and you've got to be okay with that but then you're not okay with that and that becomes a problem. Yeah. And so I'm not good enough. And so I'm not a part of the community anymore. So I, I, can't, I can't win either way. And so I think that's sort of the frustration for me. It isn't so much the community, like, you know, have, have your tribes, like live in your delusions. Like I'm fine with that. But, you know, when sort of the complexities of the real world sort of come into that delusion, like accept that or don't try to bring me in um don't try to make me a part of this um and that's sort of like one of the issues that i have with cornbread tube which i've just found so annoying is that they're always the ones even after my cornbread tube video a few of them of the big ones reached out to me and said that they want to have a conversation with me they want to talk to me they want to like sort everything out or whatever i don't know what that meant but whatever they wanted to sort things out and then i said fine and then they just ghosted me completely yeah and that's that's the thing that I have an issue with. I have the issue with sort of these communities sort of sending out mixed messages to the people who they don't really consider them exactly. Um, and I think that for me is the problem. That's the real problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, gosh, so relatable. I've had same exact same thing happen to me. Oh, my God, mm -hmm. Brittany, we're totally fine. Everything's great. I'll talk to you next month. Never heard from them again. It's been like six years huge youtubers like huge bread tube huge like video essayists i'm like hmm. so waiting on that dm girl but not really like actually i'm gonna be real with you I, I dbt really did help me realize like it's not personal in my opinion it's not personal it's not about me because yeah. like honestly yeah. fd signifier showed up in my chat like six months ago four months ago i don't even remember when and he was like we should talk i was like i'll reach out I haven't had the spoons to reach out, but it's not personal. I literally just like, I want to die. Like I'm busy dying every day because of my fibro and I haven't reached out to him because like I'm social stuff is exhausting and new relationships are exhausting, but I hope he doesn't take that personal, you know, but maybe he is like, maybe he's sitting at home being like, Brittany said she would contact me, but like she hasn't. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. But like, I know people are just in their own heads, which is why I think the community yeah. is a beautiful idea. But like I just reviewed um, a Jubilee video about people, um, autistic people talking about how lonely they are, even though they have great individual relationships. They're like, where's my community? It's a myth. The community only works for very specific kinds of people, like you said, in the same way where I'm willing to forego my individuality to make a group dynamic work. But they do that like every weekend and I'm not willing to do that every weekend. I'll do it for a week. I'll do it one week out of the year. I'll do it for some time. But, like, I'm not willing to do it every weekend. So, like, I don't need a friend group. Like, I grew up watching Seinfeld and Friends and, like, How I Met Your Mother. And I've had so many friend groups come and go. 
And I mm. realized the best, most important relationships that I've had that are profound are individual ones. And by the way, if I brought mm -hmm. my like three besties together in a room, they would kill each other. Because I like diverse people. So all of my best friends are so differently diverse that they would mm. not get along together. So mm -hmm. I let go of this idea of wanting this like perfect friend group because I've every time I had it, it did implode. One on one, mm. it was great, but all together, it just like different directions, different values, different rules. So yeah. I, I guess I want to like every time you talk and again, please don't let me like project onto you, but I'm like, oh, she's like going to pop all the bubbles and she's going to form her own bubble because like obviously she's not vibing with the bubbles, which is fair. I think most of the people in my audience don't vibe with the bubbles. They just like them and they visit them and their families in them. But like mm -hmm. everyone's living in a delusion. I'm living in a delusion. Like the idea mm -hmm. that Brittany thinks she knows what she's doing is the delusion of the human species that keeps us going. I know what I'm doing. I'll keep going. But like, I don't mm -hmm. know that. It's a belief. So like, mm -hmm. why not just pop all the bubbles and like form a kidology bubble at home and then pop into these other bubbles and visit until you find this girl that's also like pop the bubbles and doesn't fit into the queer groups. Cause like, girl, your wife not going to fit into the bubbles either. My sorry. Your wife isn't going to fit into the bubbles either. Like you're going to find a woman who's also like you and not fitting into the communities. Right. Yeah, I guess so. Probably. Yes. So where's yeah. she, like, where's she hanging out? I mean, I think that's the only bubble that I really see. The only bubble that would have meaning to me and significance to me would be the bubble of me and a partner. Um, that would be the only one that I would actually be convinced of the sort of reality of. Yeah, vibes. Um, otherwise, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not terribly convinced by sort of a bubble of my own making. Oh, um, so you don't want to make one alone. Mm. Interesting. So I don't you, think I have enough. Yeah, 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 go. Self, uh, I don't think I have enough self-confidence or self-love for that. Okay, mm. fair. I think that's a journey. That That is a journey, to be fair. I mean, I didn't actually formalize even the idea around bubbles until like 30 anyways, and I didn't even formalize my own. It was such a – it took years to like formalize what was my bubble. So I would say like even finding out the journey takes forever anyway. So like you're – you know, who? what is time? It's an illusion. Um, but I will say like, obviously you're right. Like you have your own bubbles or maybe you're waiting and then you form a bubble with somebody else. Like if that's the decision you're going to make and then that's the, it becomes like a combination. Right. So mm. I think that's within reason. Yeah. But I could like, could you see, isn't it interesting? Like, um, do you ever think about the you in 10 years since you brought it up? Like in 10 years, I might have this relationship. Like where is the you in 10 years that has a relationship? Like, what is she like? Do you, do you see her? Can you visualize her? Yeah, I think so. I think like in my mind, when I do visualize myself as sort of like the person that I want to be, I'm always a lot older than I am now. Mm. Um, you know, I, I really don't associate anything terribly positive, like in my own sort of sense of value with sort of the young me who's very insecure and sort of very much sort of like a, a deer in the headlights of just the world really. Um, so Yes, I, I do feel that with like sort of age and where I want to be and sort of the steps that I need to take to where I want to be, that that will be sort of of my later life, really. Um, I think I definitely have found that I want to go back into academia and that's sort of very important to me. Um, I sort of am a bit lost at the moment, I think, just in my personal life and sort of what I'm doing. Um, I think it doesn't help sort of living in a country where, um, unlike in the States, which I think is a lot more understanding of sort of being uh, a self-employed content creator, mm -hmm. it's sort of not taken seriously here like at all. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's sort of really limited my prospects of sort of building a life here. Um, and I also don't see my life here. I haven't. I haven't found kinship with um, the British sort of uh, in like sort of a meaningful way. Um, and so I don't see my future as being here exactly. Um, but I don't know where I sort of see my future as being exactly. Um, I couldn't go back to South Africa. Uh, I don't see that as a possibility at all. Mm. Um, so yes, I'm not, I'm not too sure. So I think at this point I'm a bit, I'm a bit sort of like lost and not really knowing where I'm going and what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I guess I sort of have this like sort of uh, blind faith 
that at some point, like sort of in my mind, when I visualize like the person that I want to be, who is always like sort of in like her mid forties, that I'll have figured it out, and then I'll be able to attract the woman into my life that I want to attract into my life. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we'll see. Um, like at this point in my life, I don't see myself attracting that woman like at all. Um, just sort of being like an objective analysis of who I am, of sort of what I do, of how I live, everything like that. Yeah. Um, like it, it's not uh, attractive or sort of like uh, sort of sending out sort of radioactive messages into like the world of woman exactly. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's, I mean, I say this all the time. If I had met my partner just like four years before, two years before, or three, like we wouldn't have been, I don't believe in the right right person, wrong timing. Like I don't believe in that. I just think like if it's the wrong timing, it's the wrong person. So like the right timing is also a combination of where you're at and where they're at. And mm -hmm. so like when you're looking for like the love of your life, I think like millions of people are out there that are the love of your life. Let's say a million, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's like, are you guys meeting at the times that make sense? So like if I had met him when we were like, it felt like we, I always love to ask him like, okay, what were you doing at 24? What were you doing at 26? What were you doing at 20? Like, where were you? Like, what were you doing? What were you doing at 12? Like, what was your life like? And then we'll sit there and we'll talk about like what we were doing in our life or like, what were you doing in 2010? Mm. It's like, tell me about that time in your life because you know, we're all on a journey and then we're like past crossing paths. Like even you and I have like now just crossed a path. And like, mm. who knows how long we'll know each other. But yes. like, it's kind of exciting to realize like, oh my gosh, like this is going to be a memory. I remember like, it doesn't matter if I know you for the next five to 20 years. Let's say I'm 99 years old. I'm going to remember that girl that I met through the internet. And I got to share these moments with like, that's going to be significant to me. Like, I'm going to remember that. And that's going to be so cool. Um, mm. But then again, it's like, well, like I, in my head, when you came out, uh, even as a, like a queer person in general, I was like, in another life, Z and I could have married, but like maybe not, right? Like maybe we're not compatible. Maybe our age gap doesn't make sense. Maybe our life doesn't make, but you would think like, oh my gosh, like two YouTubers on the internet, make it happen. But like the, there's so much more that needs to happen for this to be your person. It needs, yes. like, it needs to be so much more to say, I want to do life with you. Mm. And yet it's not even the consciousness, but the consciousness and where it's at that matters so like again I had to meet him when I met him he had to meet me when he met me and by the way on paper holy crap on paper it probably was the worst time for him to come into my life um because I was undergoing this diagnosis there was like a death there was like so many things happening just like up and down like my life was like crazy but I ended mm -hmm. up being the perfect person to come into my life because he was able to handle it and it wasn't a deal breaker for him so our relationship started off with my life being kind of like, hey, I'm getting diagnosed. You probably don't want to date somebody who's he's like, yeah, I, I don't know. The conversation's too good. So let's just keep talking. And that's what we did. We kept talking and we only had talking. Yeah. And you know what I mean? And so I do agree with you that the person you are now and who, know you, who knows who you'll be tomorrow, but probably isn't going to run into her soulmate just right now. Hmm. But I kind of like that idea that like you're cooking. You know, you're like forming, you're doing your journey, which I think in a way is like forming your own bubble or at least starting the foundation of it. Because like when you come home, your apartment, does that feel like a safe bubble or no? Um, like sort of the place where I'm at like peace with well, myself the... or where I feel the most myself. Yes, and it can be a physical place or a spiritual one. I feel like I'm my own bubble, but my apartment is also the, phys the physical representation of my bubble. So depending on how you want to have that conversation, I'm open to either exploration. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I associate a lot of like sort of negativity with like just me living in my space because when I'm in my space, I think that's when I'm most conscious of, I say, um, sort of my looks. Uh, it's when sort of, uh, you know, there's mirrors around me. It's when I sort of can't look at myself when I'm taking off my makeup, uh, when like I'm taking off my wig or my weaves or whatever. It's like sort of associated with a lot of sort of the person that I am underneath all of like the cosmetics and stuff, which makes me very, very insecure. Uh, and sort of is really something that really cements a lot of my feelings about uh, myself physically. 
um so i wouldn't say it's sort of like a place where i associate a lot of positivity to in that sense um but also in a way I do because it's also the place where I get to do my makeup and then I can go out into the world feeling like I look decent and like, you know, bearable. So I think a bit of both, exactly. I think for me, sort of like a a bubble for me personally in my space would be like a place that is a home for me. Uh, and I think for something to be a home for me, it has to be very, I think it really has to sort of uh, a lot of, I think a very integral need that I'd have to meet is sort of having a partner um, sort of making that home with me. Um, and also um, accepting or sort of loving me, whether I look good or not, uh, I guess. Um, and so I sort of associate that sort of image of sort of a bubble that is like my place, my sort of, uh, you know, where I live with that sort of image and that sort of hope for the future. Yeah. Do you mind me? This is super, super personal. So please don't answer if you don't want to. Um, if you could look differently, what would you look like? Oh, interesting. Oof. I think if I could look differently, I think I would have Like sort of the weaves that I have, I guess they wouldn't be weaves. They'd actually be like the, the hair that grows out of the roots of my head. Um, hmm. I think that's, that's the main thing. I think everything else I can sort of deal with. I think maybe if there was sort of an element of like permanent makeup that I could wear, mm. I think there are some things that I would sort of maybe permanently try to uh, do. Um, Yeah, I think that's that's primarily it. Yeah. I think my relationship with my skin color isn't so much that I have an aversion to being black um, or that, like, I hate my skin and I wish I was white, which a lot of people think it is. True. I think it's more so the way that I'm treated because of that and because I, the way that I'm treated, not so much by white people and as much as by black people, um, when it comes to um, what we're talking about, sort of like the group think and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that's what makes me the most um, ambivalent about my skin color. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think how sort of integral it's become to so much that it otherwise shouldn't. Um, in the way that sort of people treat me, I find that when I interact with people, when they first interact with me, they're either quite scared because they just associate being black, especially in the UK, with sort of being incredibly progressive and sort of everything has to be very politically correct and sort of don't cause me offense or whatever and sort of really pussyfooting around me a lot. Um, and that gets quite frustrating. Um, and so, yeah, I think if there wasn't so much, I guess, so many assumptions associated with uh, my skin color, I guess that that wouldn't feature so heavily in my life as sort of a thought um but yeah yeah i guess sort of like I, I think because of just everybody who i've grown up with who i've been raised by by white people i think sort of being black isn't so important to me um like it's not something that sort of i think about that much when i sort of see myself in my mind i don't necessarily see myself as like having like a color mm. um like it's not sort of like the important thing exactly i guess if i had to sort of envisage myself like as an image I would be black but it isn't something that I sort of purposefully like sort of think of like I have this beautiful chocolate skin and like it's just radiating in like my 40th year of life so um yeah 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 I think it, it would mainly sort of I think definitely things to do with like um the cosmetics and hair because since I've gotten my hair done and worn cosmetics I've been treated so much better by society um it's honestly astounding um yeah. but yeah, yeah yeah i uh said on stream the other day that if my personality looked like a person it would look like me and i think that's like very true i actually think we all kind of look like our personalities mm. and mm -hmm. i think that that's what's sometimes the problem is that we mm. 
have to contend that other people look like theirs. And then when we all interact, it's like all of our personalities either get along or don't get along. Like, I feel like I get along with you. Mm -hmm. Right. So like my brain is like, okay, cool. I get along with this personality type. And I meet a lot of people that I say, like, remind me of you or like are in your trope. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I like those people, but I don't get along with, like, these types of tropes. And I'm like, why not? Oh, because these types of tropes also don't get along with me unless this is the circumstance. So I was thinking about something I also said on stream the other day, which resonated with a bunch of people, which I really loved, which is, like, words seem to not have meaning to me unless I think about the intent behind them. So I noticed, like, even slurs, like, they don't process in my brain as anything significant unless I value the intent behind them. So mm. I've noticed that like even when it comes to joking or sarcasm or any word, any word, it doesn't matter what it is. And this is me being very honest. Like I seem not to have any emotional response to it unless I have just like unless I'm like, I think you're trying to insult me. Like and I need to confirm, is that what we're doing? Oh, that I'm upset. And like I'm only I'm not upset at the word you used. I'm upset at your intent. Why are you throwing negativity in my way, girl? Like why are you throwing it at me? And so I wonder, like, do you relate to that at all? Like, do words seem to impact you the same, like slurs and stuff like that? No, not at all. I think I agree with you completely. It's the intent behind them. That's why the C slur um, for Black people, that's why that, mm -hmm. I take that very seriously. Like, I don't sure. care if you say the N-word if you're rapping, because sure, sure, sure. the intent behind that is very different. There's a real intent, a real malicious intent behind yeah. that's that slur, um, which is very much a, our black identity is confirmed by the fact that they're black people who are not like us, and therefore you are justified in shaming them, in ridiculing them, and yeah. bullying them because into submission, and because they're not like us, and they're not real black people. Yeah. And I think that intent is very, uh, as I said, very malicious and very insidious and sort of very contrary to everything which apparently <laughs> progress stands for mm -hmm. um and so that's why i have that sort of a very sort of not just a personal but sort of a very um you know direct response to that yeah relative to sort of other stars i think that um as you said it's sort of the intent behind them that is very very important uh, and that is the main thing with words as well um even words that are deemed outdated about things like i watch your stream where you're reacting to um I think a series of um, little people in the oh, UK yeah. mm -hmm. um, and somebody in the chat got really upset because somebody was calling little people um, dwarves. Yeah, yeah. And for me, with that, it's sort of what's the intent behind it. It's the intent behind saying that. Like, um, for sure. you know, um, and of course, there's different people who have different ideas. Like, for instance, I don't get insulted by the answer um because i think that there's far too many rules about who can say it and who can't say it according to different people based on how progressive they're feeling that day mm -hmm. um so it's just very convoluted i think but um yeah yeah i think definitely like you said the intent behind it uh, i think is very very important to understanding sort of not just ourselves, but I think that the integral meaning of language itself and sort of how we communicate with each other. I think so much of what is wrong now with all these different identity groups is that there's just so much miscommunication mm. because everybody has their own different set of language and meanings and intents that we don't actually really understand each other. And um, I think that that's really affecting sort of the ability to actually move on from a lot of these sort of culture wars that are happening yeah. sort of everywhere um and i think language is a very important part of that most definitely i think yeah. when you live in a time when people can quite literally make up meanings for like words like for the c word which is what fd signified did recently made up his own complete meaning to justify bullying people i think that's when there's a real problem and that's something that uh that I think some of, in my opinion, I wouldn't say the worst people, but the, the worst intended sort of um, arguments come from um, that really lead to very dark places and very, very dark human activities and justifications. Yeah. Yeah, gosh, you know, and honestly, so I hold the belief that we are animals evolved on a planet and that we repeat cycles. And so this reminds me of the Tower of Babel, right? Just like the story that you learn about growing mm. up like Catholic Christian is you grow up learning about, you know, God forcing everyone to like 
speak differently and not understand each other. But I think it's always been this way. I don't think it's a new phenomenon. I think we're in the new cycle of the phenomenon. So it feels like it means something. But I feel like I'm always just looking at the world like, oh, we're repeating the cycle from this year of history. Cool. And like, mm -hmm. oh, I, this already happened to our ancestors, but now we're doing it. And so mm -hmm. that's what it always feels like to me is like, what blip in history am I existing in? And like remembering that I'm going to be a part of the group that like, those people existed then, but like no one's going to remember mm. me as an individual, right? Like, thank God, you know, but like also that's what it feels like. So um, when I think about that, it makes me remember that I also have this problem like with my own family, with my sometimes my best friends get very mm. upset at how I use words. And I'm like, you can be pissed all you want, bro, but I love you, but I'm not going to change the way I talk. And they're like, but you're using the word wrong. And I'm like, I'm using the word in the context I understand it. And this is actually criticism I get of my work a lot. So do you not see that from my work? Because like that's the reason the debate space doesn't like me. They're like, why does Brittany always use words different? They think I make up words, which I, I am. It is a fact that my bubble uses words differently. That is true. But like they see it as like you don't see that from my content. I'm just I'm kind of surprised. Yes. But I think that there's enough explanation around that, enough mm -hmm. recognition that you use words differently, that you don't expect everybody else to understand that, and you don't expect the world to necessarily change its meanings and its understandings for sure for the bubble. For sure. And I think that's sort of the difference. Like, I can come into your community and I can understand what's going on because there's all these different words and terminologies and understandings, but they're sort of explained in the context of this is what we understand. This is how we see it. Mm. The world's going to see it differently. And that's the world because humans are going to human. Right, right, right. But I find that with other communities, it's like, this is how we define words and how we see words. And the world sees it a different way. And the world's wrong. Yeah. And the world's messed up. And we need to change the world. Or you need to just ignore, well, not ignore the world, but you need to like tell the world that it's messed up and wrong and everything and disrupt i guess sort of understandings that a lot of people have or different understandings that different people and different groups and different bubbles have mm -hmm. um and that just creates even more conflict even more misunderstanding um rather than it being a sort of an acceptance of just the complexity of meaning and of okay. language and yeah. of things like that um so i do recognize that difference between i'd say sort of going into your bubble and sort of going into other bubbles Okay. I appreciate, I think, I think we're going to take that as a compliment. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's our goal. Like that is our goal is to say that, Hey, like we're all kind of different. It's like when I hear conservatives say like men and women mean something, Brittany, you can't just make a new definition up. And I was like, well, I mean, I know that, but also haven't we always done that? So like, I agree. So like, that's the problem when people ask me like, what does it matter a woman? I'm like, what bubble am I in? Cause mm. I kind of feel like it's a belief, like what a man or a woman is. I'm not sure that it is. I'm not sure that, because I believe everything. I'm sorry, say that again. I said definitely. Mm. I said. Yeah, because everything is through our perception. Like, look, my my lifelong journey is going to be like trying to find capital T objective truth, which I'm not sure we'll ever have a relationship with, because that would mean we would need to. It would need to be out of sight of human perception. Mm. And mm. that's why I think the mythos of God is so beautiful because God knows and sees all like Santa Claus. It's like we create these figments so we can say someone at least knows what the truth is. Like, I don't know what's in everyone's mm. hearts. So I'm mm. using my perception to see like, is this person ill-intended or like well-intended? And it's like, I'm using my perception, but my perception is biased and prejudiced. And so I have to remember to like filter my own perception as being like, this must be something I'm not understanding, or I'm just going to say it, this is my perception, but like, it's still just my perception. How do I know it's real? Mm. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's a very, very interesting question. Oh, oh, that's, that's difficult. I think that that's, I think for a lot of people, that's where the issue comes because that just disrupts everything that they understand about their bubble equating to like truth with a capital T right. and then that sort of just disrupts everything and destroys the world and everything like that like um for instance I mean this is a good because this recently happened to me actually because mm. I'm sort of in in like just discovering and realizing that I'm a lesbian um there's this whole conversation about like sort of uh, lesbians and trans women and trans lesbians or trans yeah. as they called and everything and like in my mind i'm like you know I'm, I'm pretty i guess like sort of 
I'm sort of, I'm, I'm woke to an extent, like there's a limit to my wokeness, definitely. And sure. sort of, I'm quite socially conservative in myself. So I'd never believe myself to like dance, uh, to dance, to date a transpian, say. Long story short, I went clubbing this weekend for my birthday. I went for the first time to a queer club wow. and I was on the dance floor and I saw this beautiful woman, started making out with her. Um, for a good half hour, about 25 minutes into it, I realized that this woman was a trans woman. Mm. And I was like, oh, wow, goodness. And I wasn't put off at all. And it really afterwards, when I left the club, it sort of, I had a moment of sort of, I wouldn't say crisis exactly, but sort of a moment of, I believe something about myself, which now has been like completely like destroyed mm, and that. decimated love and like that. sort of the thing that i had of like in my bubble like a particular sort of truth with a capital t has sort of now it, it doesn't apply so what does this mean and i think for a moment i had like sort of like heart palpitations like oh my goodness like what am i now like what what is this what is my value system but it really didn't matter and it really like sort of afterwards i was like you know that was a fun experience quite funny like sort of mm -hmm. when I realized I was like oh, oh wow goodness me how did I not know this and it sort of made me like realize sort of when I see on Twitter all these predominantly conservative men saying you know oh I can tell the difference between a real woman and a trans woman and mm -hmm. everything and I guess like to an extent like I guess before that experience I would have probably thought that yeah I'm sure I could do that as well yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I couldn't uh, and I was as sober as uh, you know a Alcoholics Anonymous person, you know, I was really like, I was all there, you know, yeah, I, yeah. It was about me, um, but still, and, you know, so I think, I think sometimes we just have to embrace the absurdity of our own truths as well, and just accept that we really don't know at all, yeah. and that isn't the end of the world, and it's not the end of the world if, like, our truths and our sort of understandings of things, mm. Um, mm. I guess even our definitions just don't actually apply in yeah. the real world. Uh, especially when we're using those definitions to not cause sort of, I guess, harm to people, yeah. uh, like direct harm, uh, to justify particular behaviors toward people. Um, then yeah, I think it's fine, but I think it's also important to just realize that our beliefs and our truths are not infallible. Um, and I think that's very, very difficult. Well, especially when you kind of, like, I feel like I'm a very consistent person, but I also mm. want the freedom to change because I know that truth will cause me to change. I always say, like, I'm indifferent to, like, whatever reality is. I just want to know what it is because I'm not here to argue the truth. I'm here to argue what is real, but real is also a part of that perception of truth. Like, that's why I'm pro-religion because it's a mm. part of perceptual truth. Mm. And if they want to have that perceived truth, I think it's valid. And I want my parents to have a safe space in the world. But I had the same experience with, like, non-binary people where I was like, I'm bisexual, I'm bisexual, I'm bisexual, I'm bisexual. I made podcasts, I made videos, I made statements. And then my partner was like, yeah, I don't think you're technically bisexual, bro. I think you're pansexual. I was like, I am not pansexual. Like, I absolutely know I'm not pansexual. And then we were talking and he was like, yeah, but like you've dated non-binary people. You've had sex with non-binary people. And I was like, yes. And he's like, so you're pansexual. And I was like, but I don't like their politics. And he was like, does that change the fact that you're attracted to them? And I was like, oh good point i'm not attracted to their politics which made me think like oh, i'm not attracted to non-binary people which is so stupid because mm -hmm. of course i am i'm just not i'm attracted to like you're like the but like the political correctness bubble does kind of get to me but also like what does politically correct even mean when it's a construct within of itself because there are things that i don't like the way people talk a certain way but it's not the words they're using it's the intention they're using mm -hmm. i feel like my political correctness has to do with like intention like don't be mean like you can be a bitch, but you can't be mean. <laughs> like you know, mm, you can be bitchy, true. you can say things, but don't be cruel to people. Don't like, don't like, want to hurt people. Mm. You know, and like that's what I'm looking for in people. So even I like started using the word pansexual because I realized like, oh, I am attracted to like non-binary people or like different genders. Like I don't seem to care because again, what they're telling me is like I perceive this truth about myself through my lived experience, and I'm pretty good at validating those lived experiences. They don't seem to bother me. Hmm. And that's something I learned about myself where I was like, oh, I am pansexual. Like, it doesn't actually bother me if you're gender fluid or like, but like, I used to think it did only because of the politics associated with it, which is like so funny how we, I limited hmm. myself 
and thinking about my choices because I associated a belief with a gender or a skin color. See how I limit myself? Me. Even me. Mm -hmm. I have to pop a bubble all the time and remind myself like this is a construct. And like mm -hmm. you can limit yourself to the construct, but you also don't have to. Mm. Kind of ironic. Indeed. Definitely. Yeah. Um, question for you. Someone brought it up. In, oh, well, first of all, how are your spoons doing? And do you need a potty break? I'm fine, personally. Okay. Do you? I'll I need a pee break eventually because I drink a lot of tea. So, like, eventually. But I want to okay. ask you, ask you just. Chat your chat in the meantime if you want. <laughs> do you want to? Actually, do you mind? Chat with my chat, girl. I'm going to pee. Not at all. Not okay, at guys, all. I just you need to. Okay, guys, you You're going to open my phone so then okay. I can see the chat Perfect. and guys, what they say. <laughs> you're all hers. She's all yours. Treat her kindly. <laughs> Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, okay. I think I've got... I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a boomer with um, technology, so <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> um, so I've, I've got the chat open on my phone. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, yes, I'm seeing the chat now. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, hello, Davros. Hello, Marcus, not Aurelius. Lovely to see you. I've missed you too. Always miss you guys. Oh, my little family. Oh, that's great. Oh, hello. Oh, thank you so much, Nero. That's very kind of you. Oh, I'm so glad that you're enjoying the conversation, Rock Paper Plato. I do love your name. I do, I do see you in the chat all the time. I see, well, actually, I, I think I know pretty much all of you, actually. I've seen all of your profile pictures, know all your names. Brett Mello, yeah, I know you. I know you. Yippee, I know you. Miss Fishy, I know you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness how are you all doing are you all doing well is everything going well miss fishy kid what do you look for in a woman ah hmm what do i look for in a woman i think for me i think a need that i have that i really really find that i have is that i need a woman to be proud of me I've never had that in a relationship that I've been in uh, or people that I've dated seriously. Um, I've never had somebody be proud of me yet. Um, and I think that's very important to me. That would mean a great deal to me. And I've sort of recognized that that's a need that I have. So I think that that's, that's one thing that I would look for in a woman, somebody who is proud of me, I think. Uh, I think that's, that's quite integral. Yes. Um, Oh, Brett Miller, Z, what do you think would be a pivotal event that could alter how you view your self-worth? Big question. Indeed, a very big question. Um, oof. Brittany's probably not going to like this, but I do find that my sense of self-worth increases a hundredfold when I'm in a relationship with someone. I, I sort of feed off that sort of, that sense of worth that I get from someone um that really really i i've noticed that like everything about me just transforms suddenly i can conquer the world when it comes to sort of somebody sort of pinpointing me as their sort of significant other um and so i do i really do feed off that um i i haven't found it or been able to locate it in myself so yes i think that that's a pivotal thing which is probably not a good thing and probably quite toxic but hey de ho Maybe with age, I'll figure something out. Maybe, maybe, but we'll see. We will see. <laughs> yes. um, they actually I saw uh, the thing I wanted to bring up to you is a comment I saw from one of them. So I don't know which one of you left this comment, but it was interesting because some people, obviously huge fans of you in my comment section, which I appreciate. I think uh, most people here do love your content. Um, mm. They brought up this idea of like being with somebody that thinks differently than you. Somebody left a comment like, Z has a hard time dating because – um, she's more of a centrist and like, could you imagine she couldn't date these progressives? Like they don't like people have different opinions, but like an opinion on politics is arguably an opinion about values. Do you uh, subscribe to that? Think. I don't think I do. Oh, tell me more. I think I would be very willing to date a very progressive person. Like you can be as progressive as you want to be. Um, you know, that's, that's what you're doing in your political life. But I do distinguish very like hardcore between sort of like your political values and your personal values, because oftentimes I don't see the two 
lining up in like the real world, especially not on the internet. Sort of there's a huge difference between what somebody says their values are and sort of projects into the world as sort of their brand and their politics mm -hmm. um, and their personality politics, especially, and their actual values, like sort of in the home with their partner. Um, and so I, I, you do what you've got to do in the world to sort of figure yourself out in the world with your people and your tribe and your, your group. Mm -hmm. But in our house, it, it's between you and me. And so for me, I, I feel that it's more about building values together with each mm -hmm. other um, that I would consider quite sacred and personal um, as opposed to it sort of being about what you do beyond our doorstep. So I wouldn't have a problem actually dating a progressive person. I really wouldn't. I, I really, you can be as sort of, you know, as progressive as you need to be. Um, because I do find um, that oftentimes these very progressive people online who I see, especially the video essayists, when it comes to sort of little hints of like their personal lives and what they do and um, when they put out an occasional vlog or something, they're living pretty ordinary lives. Like their lives are pretty much like exactly the same as mine, really. What they do, what they care about. You know, we're pretty much all just caring about like paying rent and like, you know, mm -hmm. walking the dog. So it's it's sort of, I like to distinguish between that. So I, I really don't, because I consider myself, I guess, quote unquote, apolitical. I know people don't like that very much, but that doesn't feature in sort of my judgment of you. What what really features is how we build our value system together um, under our roof and sort of in our personal lives. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you can be as you can be as conservative or as liberal as you need to be um, beyond me. Brainstorm with me then, because okay, first of all, <laughs> if you're not dating on the internet, what does it matter what the internet's doing? So like what, are real, like, what are real people doing? So like you gave me examples of like um, the internet, but like what are real life people doing if you're not dating on the internet? You're dating real life people. So like what is their politics in, in relationship to their life like? Like with the people you're dating in real life, like how does politics play into their life? Attracted to sort of dating in real life more because I find that that's when I see more of the sort of the personal values as opposed to sort of the broader values which i think on the internet is sort of that's like the creme de la creme of sort of an internet identity is really mm -hmm. sort of projecting a value system that's like this whole political ideology like that is like more complex than like Karl marx and i can't i can't i can't see you or get to the root of who you are and all of that i can't sort of yeah. dig through all of that i find and i think that the internet just really uh, feeds into that and really creates a, a space for a lot of that. Um, I'd say especially with what I've seen of uh, lesbians on the internet who are like quite public, it's sort of really, yeah. I sort of can't, I can't strip away at sort of the branding and the aesthetic and like, you know, the fashion and everything. Like I can't see you underneath all of that. And I find that a lot easier to locate when I'm sitting one-on-one -on -one with a person, like either on a date or speed dating even. Speed dating yeah. is great for that because uh, everybody's very insecure. Everybody's very like nervous and everything. And yeah. so no matter how good looking you are, like you can make an absolute bum of yourself. And I think that's great because that really shows how human you actually are mm -hmm. rather than what you sort of try to curate yourself as. Um, so yeah, that's why I don't like the internet. And that's why I've deleted dating apps um, recently because it's just too much. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting because like I come from a religious bubble where your politics are your values. You can't separate them. So like a Republican wouldn't date a Democrat. Like that's, what are you doing? Like even growing up, the only, per like James Carville was like this really famous political analyst and he was infamously married to an opposite party partner. So Republican and Democrat married and like everyone would be like, holy fuck, how are they doing it, bro? Because nobody in my circle is Democrats only dated Democrats and Republicans only dating Republicans and like pro-lifers only dated pro-lifers. A pro-lifer and a pro-choicer, never gonna fucking happen, right? And honestly, that is my worldview as well. I'm not marrying a pro-lifer, dude. I tried in my 20s to marry people with different opinions than me and it honestly made me crazy because I was ashamed of my partners because mm. they were – we didn't have the same values ultimately. 
Like if mm. I was dating somebody that was like indifferent to cheating or indifferent to like, th like that's not a shared value, dude. So like I need to have shared values, you know? So how do you, can how do you, when you say you can be as conservative as you want to be, like, can they be a KKK member? Or are you saying like, are they going to be as left as they want to be? Can they be a Marxist? Like, what does that mean? Uh, I would say a KK member goes a bit too far because I think that that would then infiltrate into our personal okay. values in the home. Um, okay. Like sort of like, I would consider like discourse on cheating to be like a sort of sacred value, like in the home. Like that's sure. something that I think is like a value system that isn't, isn't about politics because that sort of like is really a one-on-one -on -one thing. Um, but things like being a pro-lifer uh, or not, for me, um, I feel that that, I mean, that would be a bit different with me, I think, or with lesbians, I think. I think that's sort of like a conversation that's a, a bit difficult to sort of do you believe have in IVF? In our personal like, lives. Would you, Sorry. Well, would you guys want to have babies? Because like what like example of a pro-life, like in my pro-life bubble, mm. they don't believe in abortions for ectopic pregnancies. They think the woman should figure it out and see if she dies. Or they can get rid of your fallopian tube. Let's say the baby's stuck there, the embryo. Then you can mm. like, but they don't believe in abortions. So like they're willing to risk the life of the mother for that embryo. Like for mm -hmm. that baby, are you like okay with that? Like, what if your wife is pro pro life and she like risks your life for that embryo? Is that something like you you think about? Are you not having babies? Like, would she make the same? Would she make the same medical decisions for you? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I think with me personally, um, it, it's I definitely uh, hold sort of sacred like my, my body, my choice, uh, and likewise for the wife in question. Got it, got it. Um, <clears throat> In terms of having like values, I think often times or not necessarily often times, but I think when you're face to face with your values, when it's really in your face, like somebody is suffering because of your said value, like somebody is carrying a non-viable fetus, um, is, you know, their health is in decline, they could yeah. potentially die or something like that. I think when you're faced with that reality, it can hit very differently to when you're just being um not even just an edge lord but being you know a good hearted catholic yeah, uh yeah. who's um sort of pro life no matter what uh you know you're all, always people are always very hardcore with their values until it actually comes into their real world and into their realities and they have to sort of actually reckon with that um and i think that that's I would like to have a partner who I would know that if their values, if their political broader values about how everybody else should apparently live their lives actually came, um, you know, home to roost, as the saying goes, with like chickens coming home to roost. Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to know that I'd have a partner who was sort of uh, introspective enough to reckon with that. Um, they may not come to the same conclusion as I'd like sort of hope, but I, I would hope that they would be human about it. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'd hope that they would value my, say, health if making a decision on my behalf. Yeah. If I wasn't able to make that decision. Yeah. Um, and I'd have faith that they would do that. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, because I'm not just anybody. I'm not just sort of a statistic that validates their belief system. I'm their, their person. Um, their a part of their world an integral part of their world so i'd hope that that would make some difference and i can only really hope for that i think and have faith in that yeah it is interesting because like obviously this is um these are the topics like i bring up on a first date you know mm -hmm. like on oh, a first date interesting well i'm pretty hardcore to be fair so <laughs> obviously i dated differently throughout my whole life but the last four years or three years when i was like okay i'm ready to get married I use my brother's courting style of dating. So we call it farm brother dating on the internet, as I'm sure you've heard me say. And it was like literally like first date, make or break. The goal of the first date was to not get a second date. So basically like what do you think about trans kids? That's my favorite question to ask on a first date. Because basically how they answer will tell me whether or not we're compatible. Because even if one major – this is a major issue for me. If you're not going to validate our trans kids, like I want no relationship, zero relationship. But then the secondary part of that question is how do you want to validate those trans kids? Mm. Okay. That's the, yeah, that's the interesting question. Because then mm -hmm. that separates them into, so for the first camp is to get rid of all the people that are anti-trans. 
Then mm-hmm. the second question is to eradicate anyone who's too extreme on whatever side is pro-trans still. Mm-hmm. Because I think I'm more in the middle when it comes to this, like how to take care of trans kids. But mm. first and foremost, you cannot be anti-trans. Like you're not getting a second date if you are. I don't even want to hear a hesitation. Mm-hmm. And so like that's a big like easy deal breaker. And that's like really easy for me to be like, okay, thank you for the date. I'll pay. I'll pay for dinner. I'm good. Bye. And like I kind of feel like that's fair. I canceled the date, whatever, or do Zoom dates, whatever it is. I usually do Zoom dates to be fair. Um mm. But yeah, that was the point was to like not get to a second date versus in my 20s. The goal was to date for a few months, maybe a couple years, maybe move in together. Maybe do all those things and then see if we weren't compatible. And I just refuse. Even with this partner here, I told him like I refuse to move in with you until we're engaged or married. And that's like the condition of our marriage slash union. And he said, my condition is that we watch One Piece. So, you know. You know, we're, um, that's the, you know, so that's what we did. We got engaged and then we moved in with one another and, uh, met his parents. You know, he met my family, my siblings, and then we did what we did. But the reason I did that is because like, girl, I have money. I can fly to Europe. I'm so sick of moving people in and out of my space. I'm so sick of moving in with people and I have money. We don't have to, they live on their own. He already had his own apartment. Like I don't have to. That's another thing. I don't date people who live with their parents. Mm. Cause I'm like fiercely independent. And so mm. I need somebody who understands that. And so again, yeah, for me, first dates are so we don't have a second date. Um, and I only did that because I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good on my own, but I will say yeah. I'm, I still love my community. And even if like he died tomorrow, we talk about this all the time. Like what if he, what if he dies tomorrow? What are we doing? Cause if we can get hit by a car. We don't know. Okay. Maybe we go swimming in the sea and a shark eats us. I don't know. So I was like, what do you want us to do? I even called my parents and asked them, like, if I die in Croatia, what do you want him to do with the body? And my parents were like, oh, do whatever he wants. Like, we get it. You're dead. We'll pray for you. And I was like, okay. (laughs) Like, we talked about it just in case. Like, I don't know. And same, like, Mm -hmm. if he dies or if, like, what does he want? Like, what is what do we want? And again, I know that's, like, hopefully years away. But I think it's about having those kinds of conversations because, like, you learn so much about a person when you realize, like, the details of how they think about their own death, too. Like, I don't think I could be with somebody that cared about what happened after they died. One of the reasons mm-hmm. I love him is that he doesn't give a fuck. He's like, I'm dead. And I was like, thank you. Because, like, I'm fucking dead. I don't give a fuck. You can throw my body in the ground. I don't care. Throw it in the ocean. I mean, I would prefer you build a tree out of it or something. I would prefer it, like, sustain life. But, like, I don't fucking care. I'm dead. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think that's not – I'm not moralizing that, by the way. If you really want a significant burial and a significant thing, that's beautiful, bro. But like values, you know what I'm saying? Like he's not religious, Mm. Mm. you know? So like it'd be weird for him to want more. But at the same time, you do you. I don't want to make it sound like I'm judging people. No, no, no. They're very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Like when I think about politics, I do think about like even his progressive. Like I love that he's progressive. Like on the first date, I was like, I'm a a SW. I have an OF. What do you want to do about that? He was like, cool. I watch porn. I was like, me too. Cool. And then we were both like, cool. And then we talked about it. And then we talked and we exchanged. We exchanged mm-hmm. like what we're into. And it was really nice. And then we, you know what I mean? There's I've a never heard that before. That's very interesting. Say that again. I said, I've never heard that before. That is so interesting. Wow. When I tell you, I needed someone who's very specific for me. I mean, somebody who's like, okay. Because true, he's never dated anyone like that either. But to be fair, he was also unmarried. So it obviously wasn't working. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the point is like we were both were not married and we needed somebody who could be so safe of a space that we could do something like that. And I think that that's the point is that I I gave the test to everyone. I did the same questionnaire every first date I went on. Mm. Like, I didn't treat him any differently, though I had a feeling because we talked on DMs a lot. So by the time we came to our to be fair. To be fair to everybody, by the time we came to our actual first date over Discord, we had been talking like every day on DMs. So we hadn't done voice call and we hadn't done video yet. So to be fair, we had an inkling that we were going to get married because the mm-hmm. values were too in sync. And so then it was just the test after test. So then the first test was the first date call, which lasted eight hours. <laughs> yeah, it would have gone longer. That's a very good sign. It would have gone longer, but I had to go to work. Oh. I, had to, I had to go to work. Then the next test was him flying to the States. My next test was me going to Croatia, meeting our families, and then confirming. So there was like confirmations we had to do, but we knew 
we just knew we we're like, yep, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. We're old. We know what we've been looking for. This is it. Thank you. And then we just, it made sense. Like it made sense, you know, but I think mm -hmm. all of that came from us sharing like so many of the same values and then it reflecting in our life. So Dang. yeah, politics is so important to me. Like when I talk shit on white men, he's like, mm -hmm, white men suck. I was like, white men do suck. But then we both know that we only are talking about a specific group of white men in a specific bubble that was, you know, mm -hmm. versus some other people mm -hmm. hear that and they're like, Brittany, do you hate white men? I was like, do you think I hate billions of people on the planet or do you think i'm talking about a very specific group of ideology associated with white men and that's the thing i don't want to have to explain that every fucking time i talk to somebody so it's nice to have shortcuts in language how yes. do you do because you like you know how you're talking about dating politically correct people that's a shorthand for language Mm -hmm. Right. So what is your version of shorthand for language where you would have to you would love to be able to say something to someone and not have to explain the details of what you mean without someone thinking you're a bad person? What would a shorthand be for me? Yeah. Like mine is I hate white men. <laughs> <laughs> I guess like my equivalent would probably be like. God, I hate black people. Mm. I think that would probably be my shorthand. Fair. That would be my shorthand. Yeah. I, somebody's going to and just feel it in my yeah. bones. Hey, it's when just... that's your, look, if that's your bully group, that's your bully group. Everyone got a group that bullied them, okay? It'd always be yes. your own too. It'd always be your own. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. So very normal yes. experience, I think, especially for people that grow yeah. up, I call them in the middle, not black enough, mm -hmm. not white enough, not gay enough, not straight enough, not anything enough. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, if you're mm -hmm. being called the C word, dude, your community is literally looking at you like a traitor and that's fucked up. And I also mm -hmm. know where they're coming from in a lot of ways, obviously, but that's the group think, which I think is valid, but I also think it's not mm -hmm. as welcoming as they think it is. Mm -hmm. So I can understand that. Okay. I think that's, I think that makes sense. I feel mm -hmm. like that would be a great shorthand for someone to know what you mean. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I haven't found that, that person who like yeah. gets that yep. um yeah yes mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and i don't think for me i don't think it comes with somebody having the same political values as me necessarily mm. i think it really i don't necessarily see myself with somebody who like sort of has like my political value system uh person um i don't i don't see that as sort of being something that i would see as compatible exactly I mean, I sort of look at the world of all these people who are dating people and in relationships with people who have like the exact same political and ideological value systems as them. And I mean, how's it going for them? Like, I mean, divorce rates sky high, like everyone's breaking up with everybody. Like it, it doesn't seem to be going as well as it theoretically should be going. Mm. Um, and I think it's because a lot of that value system is just like sort of, I feel like it's a facade more so than anything. And it's sort of a distraction from actually really figuring out what are my values and having those really vulnerable, honest conversations like you describing you having with your husband. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like talking about like what you're going to do with each other's bodies and like, you know, what you're going to do with death. Like that's something that like a lot of people like, you know, yeah, wouldn't even want to talk about or wouldn't want to hear their partner say, I'll be fine. Like, yeah. you know, if you die, like, I'll still live my life. Like, yeah, yeah, I'll still yeah. find value and everything. Like, people don't want to hear that. I mean, yeah. I, even I, at this point, I mean, that's something that would be difficult for me to hear. Mm -hmm. But it is something that I do recognize, like, sort of, it's something that I wouldn't want to hear, but it's something that I think I would need to hear. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd really need to hear that, I think. Um, because that would really represent a kind of, like, a, an honesty that I really value and would really yeah. need in a mm -hmm. relationship. And honesty isn't, it isn't what we want to hear oftentimes, like, like for me a lot of honesty isn't things that i want to hear but i think it's important for me to hear and i can sort of i can really respect somebody for being very very like honest and direct with me yeah like for instance your reaction to my video like mm. that wasn't something i wanted to hear but i think it was something that i needed to hear okay. if that makes sense yeah, yeah. So, and yeah. obviously like i think the reason i and I said it to my stream, like when I was like, Kidology reached out, which just speaks so highly to your character. And it does. Like, I think you're such a good person. And I don't mean good, like in terms of morals, I mean, like well-intentioned. I think you're like a well-intentioned person. And because of that, it like means the world to me that you were able to see my well-intentions. Because I think somebody else could have had plenty of good reason to feel like Brittany's being bad, like badly intentioned towards me. 
And I, and I mm-hmm. really am not, if anything, you just spark something in my brain. Like I see, I review your video and I have an understanding of it through a lens that's specific. Like what is the difference to you between the politics and the values, right? Like, what does that mean to you? Cause like, obviously if I think about it in my own relationship, I would say we have similar enough values, but if you separate politics, like in terms of maybe like capitalism versus socialism, like maybe my husband and I would differ in that regard. Cause like I'm indifferent to what I live in. Just tell me the rules. And maybe he prefers socialism cause he's like a European and he's like, fuck capitalism. It's fucking awful. You know? So maybe we would differ in that regard. Like, what does it mean to have like a political th- opinion and a, and a value value, like a political value and a value value? Hmm. I think what I see of like a political value is when your belief isn't informed by what you actually see around you by sort of like the realities of your condition. It's formed by sort of an ideal of what the world could be an ideal of what people could be according to what you would like them to be, because that's how you see the world. That's what you want of it. And I say a value value is when your values are informed by really your own reckoning with the world as it is and not sort of projecting your ideas of what it can be or your hopes for what people ought to be or your belief of what people should be i think it's sort of very vulnerable and quite i would say that it's sort of it isn't it isn't a value it wouldn't be values that sort of lead to a sense of like security of yourself and your place in the world and i think a lot of political values really lead to that you know a lot of political values um such as around gender for instance that you know men are men and women are women and there's no such thing as being trans i think that's Mm. definitely an example of a political value which is about you feeling secure in like your projection of what you believe the world ought to be and what you believe everybody ought to be and therefore it doesn't matter what the world actually is whereas i think sort of a value finding a value in yourself would be realizing that that that's really not sort of how the world is that's not sort of like the complexities of like people living now how people especially younger people experience the world of like gender relations and everything and like we really don't know everything i think everybody including medical science are trying to figure everything out for different people different experiences different lived experiences and that that doesn't make you less of a person but of course it it means that you know your values are not going to lead you to a place of feeling like you know what's going on like yeah. you you own this shit um and that's okay as well um mm. i think that's that's quite important um yeah i see that as quite important okay and so the distinction. once again the more you talk the more i'm like okay so z is probably not gonna end up in a specific bubble because like what you just described to me is exactly how I feel like my religious family operates or the political values operate or like anyone's values operate. It's like, does my community share my values and therefore do I have the right values? And therefore I am, conf- it's like a conf- confirmation loop where like lots mm-hmm. of the people I know, including the people that have very successful marriages, they do vote the same. They think the same. They have the same values. There's differences in the nuance, of course. Like obviously my parents didn't totally always agree, but they basically voted the same, talked the same, voted on the same, like they never voted Democrat, right? Mm-hmm. That's not going to happen. So it's like that kind of thing. Um, and it, it's reassured by their community and then by their churches and then by their larger groups and then it, Tucker Carlson and all these people they watch and Trump and like da, 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 da. And same with my leftist friends. Like it's like I remember – oh, my God. That's the problem is like when I jump into bubbles, they're like – I remember my progressive friend is like, Brittany, what, how do you know if it's a man or a woman? I was like, you know what a man or a woman is, dude. Don't fuck with me. And he's like, no, I don't know what it is. And I was like, okay, like if I'm jumping into your bubble, yes, I don't know what it is. But if I'm jumping into this bubble, I know what it is. In the same way all women have to know what a man is in order to protect themselves when they're walking down the street. But also I understand what you're saying internally. I might not be able to read that man's brain and he might actually be a woman in there. And I don't know that. But like I know what a man is when I see a man. And then we talked and like whether or not it was a trans woman or trans man didn't matter to me. I'm saying I know what the image they're trying to project out to me is. And that's what I care about. I'm not actually making comment on their gender. I'm saying whatever they're trying to project towards me, I usually can tell that's projecting Mm. feminine or masculine. And then I tried to ride like what's stronger. And like maybe I'm wrong on occasion and maybe it's actually just like a masked lesbian or maybe it's like a really feminine man. And maybe I'm just like fucking up the genders. But in general, I feel like when we're having conversations, we're trying to ask ourselves like, 
do you do are you signaling or using words that mean the same thing to me so I know you're safe? I think we're also afraid of each other that the only way we feel safe is to form communities. So communities have like a comfort of protection. And so it makes sense to me that different communities would have different like ways of speaking, but then an anomaly would produce like hyper individuals that mm -hmm. are like, fuck, I don't even like know if I coincide with all of this, but I guess I could vibe the most here because like conservatives will literally say like, oh, I'm an individual. I'm so individualistic. Progressives will say, I'm so individualistic. I'm like, your consciousnesses, but your beliefs, your bubble ideas, like that's, you don't even know who you are unless the community does. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now follow me. When it comes to love and relationships, okay. how do you know who you are if you need a partner to form a bubble with you? Right. Like, are we using our partners as the proxy or like the, the replacement for the community? Yes. Okay. Tell me. I'll about say that. yes. Tell me about that. I think for me, I felt the most like at home when I've been validated by like an individual, like since being a child, like when I was like fostered, mm -hmm. I was always fostered by like an older white woman, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that was the person who like was my sort of community and my yeah. home and my, my, my sense of like worth and validation came from that because according to that person, I was good enough and I was, you know, they accepted me for all of like my differences and everything irrespective of yeah so i think i've always found that sense of community in that significant person uh who's able to really take up that role of sort of um of seeing me and and really letting me be seen by them yeah yeah mm -hmm. how often um do you get an opportunity to feel that way with yourself? Like so? Never. Never. I don't feel that way with myself. No, it's not something that I feel with myself. I, I do definitely see myself as very much depending on sort of another significant person for that sense of self-worth um, and sort of that belief in my own uh, value and my own sort of humanity, I guess. Um, it's, it's not something that I can in any way locate in myself or even in like sort of a general populace either. Mm -hmm. Um, like it really just like goes over my head when I, I think people were saying in the reaction to my video and your chat, like they like, oh, she's so beautiful. She should just come to Atlanta or something. Yeah, I think yeah, to like yeah. find <laughs> something like, you know, these things just like, it just goes completely over my head yeah. and it's because it, it's sort of that's sort of like I feel like sort of a, a, a safety response to a lot of things like it's like this is how you think the world should be and and how you want it to be and therefore like that's what xyz needs to do in order to like sort of affirm that idea of like how the world works that you know a feminine black woman will inevitably be with like a masculine black woman from Atlanta because that just makes sense in our world yeah, yeah, um yeah. As opposed to it being like sort of the reality, which is, well, actually, it's a lot more than that uh, and a lot more complex than that. And so that's not going to happen. Um, and so it's, I think. I think for me, like when it comes to just, wait, what was I saying? I think, it, was I talking about myself and. Feeling that way with the, yourself and feeling mm, like seen yeah. by yourself. Yes, yes. I feel like when it's like an individual person who's like saying that to me and they mean it and they want to be with me, mm. uh, it hits very differently to sort of that generic thing of you're a thin cis black woman who like is feminine and wears makeup and stuff like that. And so like it's going to be easy for you and it's going to be fine um, because it is it, it hasn't been that way like ever. Um, and, you know, even though that's sort of the prescription of what apparently is meant to like work, it, that's, that's not the real world. Yeah. Um, the real world is just far more complex than that. And, you know, it's like sort of a lot of people who say, oh, you're so beautiful and stuff. It's like, well, will you date me? And it's like, oh, well, no, because, you know, they're in relationships and they've got their own real lives going on and everything. And so it, it doesn't really sort of um, 
compute for me exactly in the same yeah. way that it would if there was like my one partner or when I have been in relationships that partner who has said you're beautiful and that that's really profound for me and that really makes gives me a sense of wow I am actually beautiful that I don't get from anything else or from anywhere else if that makes sense it do, it makes a lot of sense I'm having a hard time connecting it though to having like a real relationship because again you're describing dating you're not like even if people would date you for superficial reasons like being your partner is like such a rarity like look at the divorce rate right like the chances of people staying in relationships is very very difficult because people are dating for superficial reasons they're not mm -hmm. dating for real reasons and like it's fine like you can get your divorces no judgment damn but like it is one of those things where like when people are talking about finding the real partner like the actual person you're going to be like who's going to love you and wipe your butt when you have Alzheimer's, right? Like, did you see me talk to a guy named Rashad? Young Gen Zer? I think I did. I think I may have. He's, I he's think so. really great, like, like really great young. And he said, like, you know, girls really care about height. And I was like, the girl who's going to wipe your butt when you have Alzheimer's does not care about your height. The only women who care about how tall you are are women who are not going to wipe your butt when you have Alzheimer's. Like, I refuse mm -hmm. to believe the person, the consciousness out in the universe that's, like, made to love your consciousness gives a fuck about your height. But that's my mm -hmm. belief of love because I saw that in my parents. Like, my dad's, like, 5'10", and when I told him, like, women on dating apps say, like, six feet, no shorter, my dad's like, what? First of all, 5'10 is tall. I'm like, hmm. And he's like, second of all, he's like, what does that matter? What does my height matter? And I was like, I don't know. Ask them. Like, they're the ones dating, right? Mm -hmm. And so, again, like, I, I think that's superficiality. Like, oh, you know, I think it exists and I think that is the reason we're getting divorced. And I think to avoid yeah. that, you like even in my relationship, people are always like, what do you mean your husband doesn't work anymore? And I was like, what do you mean your husband doesn't? Fuck you. Like, don't be bitchy and mean like just because you don't get the relationship, bro. But like they don't get it because they're projecting all of their insecurities onto it. Mm, but like they yeah. never because they don't think about the details of my life when I share it. All they're thinking is like, oh, men who don't work are like this. Yes. Yes. But, like, that's the thing is, like, men who are married to, like, not very – like, we're in a very specific situation, okay? But, like, because of the uniqueness of our relationship, our goal is to make this team win and successful no matter how much the world is hating on it. That's all we care mm -hmm. about because it's us against the world, right? Yes. But I can't do us against the world with a partner who gives a fuck about what the internet says about our marriage. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these YouTubers will watch their marriages blow up on the internet and they'll care about what people say. They'll literally go into relationships for superficial reasons. There's all these young Gen mm -hmm. Z couples dating and breaking up online, which is fair. I've been there. I've had my relationships online. All of them weren't about that singular consciousness. They weren't about the goals we were doing. And I don't even think it's about just being in love. You have to be in love and have the compatibility. I feel like I've been in love before, but I didn't have the compatibility. Yeah. So just because oh, yes. you're in love doesn't mean you have to marry each other. Like to find the in love and the compatibility, that is a rare circumstance. Oh, yeah. So can you help me understand like when you're talking about dating and finding that partner and like getting that validation, which I think is beautiful. Like everyone wants confirmation from their partners that they find them beautiful and smart and wonderful. Can mm -hmm. you like explain to me like what happens in a reality where you don't run into her and you don't meet her? Yeah, that would be a very sad reality for me because I do, I I do see myself as really, I do feel that I need that because I feel that I, I have not been able to access that in myself and that there's sort of like an integral part of, I think, a lot of a person's development, like into adulthood that is really missing for me, that would have really formed that sort of very important base level and foundation for me mm -hmm. of being able to then um to then find that worth in myself and that purpose in myself so i do think i'll live if i don't find that person um i will i will live and i'll have to live with i think that disappointment and not finding that person but i don't see the I don't see, I think what's been very important for me is like cultivating patience in these things and living with patience, even if that patience is like literally waiting until I'm on my deathbed 
that this person will come. And I think that that is something that really keeps me going, sort of having that idea that it's not happening now, but it will happen. Mm-hmm. And I guess in a, to an extent, that's just like faith um, and a bit of hope. I think it's sort of quite religious in nature. I think everybody, like, you know, the real hardcore religious folk really have that faith and that belief and that hope. And you sort of have to, um, you know, you have to depend on that. Uh, you mm-hmm. can't waver from that, really. Uh, and I think that that's been quite important to my perspective on this, because I think when you lose, I think when you like lose faith and you lose, lose hope, you end up like one of these incels online who just hates the world because it's all the world's fault and For it's sure. got nothing to do with them. And you're just miserable. And I think I've I've been, and I do have those points of sort of misery and sort of very woe is me. Um, but I think I have improved a lot uh, in in sort of really cultivating that sense of patience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that it's sort of I need to be patient uh, not just with myself but I think with the world and sort of where I'm going in the world and what I'm doing um, you know I think I for instance hope and have faith that my future isn't going to be in the UK I don't know where it's going to be but I think that's an important step toward sort of finding this person potentially um, and having hope that that process will lead to that and having like faith that like being in a different place, a different circumstance with different people uh, is going to like make me the person that I want to be. Uh, and hopefully I'll meet and attract and find that compatible needs um, and honesty in somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, I think that's how I deal with it really by yeah. sort of just really clinging on to the sense of hope in for the future and a sort of faith in that sort of process yeah. um which I, I i get it's 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 hard it's hard for like people i find especially i think like right now young men are very impatient and i think that's largely social pressure and i think a lot of it has to do with social pressure sort of like if you're like single at a certain age then that's just there's something wrong with you there's something off like um you know you you've you failed as like a human being uh in pursuit of relationships and your own like prospects um and there's a part of me that sort of has has had that belief but i think i have to really sort of reckon with just reality and reality really does not align with that sort of statement that you failed if you're single or if you're single for the rest of your life um considering like how relationships fail every single day right now yeah 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 so yeah it's Hmm. it's tricky but i I do think that like sort of patience and having that hope in myself and in meeting that person is sort of how i deal with it exactly even though i have to reckon with the fact that potentially i may just be hoping onto my deathbed and that i'll just die alone Hmm. Okay, there's two significant thoughts I see. First, I love optimism and I incorporated it into my life like four or five years ago and I think it's radically changed my life. I think hope is everything growing up religiously. Like, absolutely, I agree with you on this. I just think it's so necessary um, because it can be daunting, like all the responsibilities and natural suffering of the world. And so I think you need that hope to kind of maintain. Um, Two, I'm writing down notes because I keep forgetting what I want to say and like I want to just remember what you talk about. So just FYI. So, okay, I've, okay, I will start with this one and then we'll move back to to the other one. But like, I just had a thought of, I think if you're in the bubble where you're settling in a marriage, it might be an accurate thing to say you have failed to find a mate. Because then that Mm -hmm. means like you fail to find anyone who just like settle with you, which might be the issue. Because often in these marriages that have led to divorce, I feel like there were relationships where they settled and then somebody Mm. outgrew the other person or somebody had a realization of like, can I have more out of a marriage? Oh my God, wait, I want more out of my life. And then they divorce, right? Mm. But if you're Mm -hmm. living the relationship journey where like you want that, that very like, like I feel like, holy crap, this is my human. Like this is my person then you're like humbled in the reality of like the rarity of meeting it, which is why you're so like, oh my God, did I just like, did I just meet like the vampire that I've read about in all my books? Like, did I just meet the like girl who's like the nerdy girl? Did I meet the trope? Like, did I meet the, whatever your version of a fantasy is? Like, did Mm -hmm. I just meet the person? Did I get my prince charming, my princess charming? It's like, oh my God. And that really, I think 
feels much more easy in my mind to say like, oh, well, I just haven't met them or like we haven't crossed paths, but it's not worth me settling. Like I could, girl, it would show on my face if I settled in a relationship. It's showed in my other relationships. Like I would wake up and be like, I'm very unhappy in this relationship. Like something's wrong, right? And he's like, I love our relationship. I was like, are you sure? Because we're like fighting every night. Don't you think that's weird? And my partner, my ex-partners would be like, nope, like fighting is normal. I'm like, I don't want to do this with you. They're like, you don't want to fight with me for the rest of our lives? I was like, nah. Like all those couples on Instagram, they're like, through the ups and downs, through all the fights, we survived. I'm like, Ugh. I'm like, that's not good. I don't want that to be our story. I don't want to have stories about fighting. I don't want to have stories like that's not a love story. Where in the book do they fight? Like where in the book do they yell at each other and demean each other? Where is their domestic violence in the love story? I don't remember mm -hmm. domestic violence in my fairy tales. So like, no. But a lot of these people are like, we made it through. Like I've met so many people that are like, oh, isn't that amazing through all the cheating and the lying? Like we survived. I'm like, sis, you do you, girl. But no. <laughs> And I've heard this from people that are like, we have like an amazing relationship. And I'm like, sure, mm -hmm. sure, bro. <laughs> and like, look, no judgment, but like, I can't, that's not going to be my love story. I refuse to like, this can't be my love story, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, when I think you're playing the settling game, yeah, sure. Maybe it feels like a failure because you didn't even get like the bottom of the barrel person to settle with you. Sure. But in terms of real success and real love, I think you have to live with the humility of knowing you might not run into that person, which is why it's so amazing when you do. Because you're like, oh, cool. We cross paths. It's kind of amazing, right? Okay, what do you think mm. about that? I completely agree with that. I definitely, I think the more that I've heard this argument from you specifically about like not settling, the more it really resonates for me. Mm. That sort of, I think like, I think I think most relationships end because people have settled. Totally. I think a lot of uh I think I, I, what I see with a, especially a lot of like young men in relationships is a lot of settling. Mm. Um mainly because men are reduced to sort of like the animalistic state of like all men need is like sex and a pretty face to look at and like that's Literally. it. So Literally. like they'll go for like the first woman that like looks at them mm -hmm. and then they wonder why their relationship doesn't work and doesn't la last and why you know they're unhappy or why they break up yeah. so i think there's i think there's way too much settling going on for people and i think it's because of pressure it's pressure it's like you know time limits if you want if you want kids then you yeah. want biological kids because mm -hmm. you know there's so much taboo about having kids any other way oh my god then totally. you know you've got you know you've got to find someone quickly and I think you find somebody when you're really not at a point of, in your life when you really know yourself or have even got to know yourself and what you actually want and value. Yeah. And then you have like these conservatives getting like married at like 20 and getting divorced at like 25, like secretly, you know, it's like, yeah. You know? And so it's just, um, I think I, I do agree with that. I really do agree with that. But I think that, like you said, it's, it's like a really difficult conversation to have with yourself that, you know, if you don't settle, then there is a very big chance that you're going to die yeah. alone. Yeah, for sure. Um, probably and no I think kids, it, probably no one at your deathbed, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I don't, I, I think most people don't want that. Yeah. But I, I think you, you can't have, in reality, you can't have the best of both worlds. Like right. you said in your reaction, you can't have your cake and eat it. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. you need to sort of choose one. And I think I've, I think I've chose to not settle but I do find that I do have my moments when I'm very pessimistic about that choice. Sure. And I really do like sort of become very doomeristic about that choice. Um, and I do feel like sort of, I guess, a pressure in myself uh, as in, you know, am I just being too picky? Am I being like the stereotypical thing where all these men online try to shame me for being too picky and that sure. this is why I'm a femme soul. This is why I'm like, not finding Are relationships or things like Kid? that. Are they married? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think <laughs> most of them are, no. I'm just no. saying they're the ones who are like, well, why are they single? Why are they single? If I say one more red pillar, argue about why women are single when they're all single. I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. I don't oh, want to yes. hear it. You know who I copied my relationship after? Two specific people. They're both in their like 65, 70s, and they're both been married mm -hmm. over 30, 40 years. That's who I look at, and I say, how do I have that? Mm -hmm. That's all I want. I don't want any other modern relationship. I want nobody else. I want that. How do I get that? Not the exact like cookie cutter, but how do I have this? Mm -hmm. Like, how do I have this? I was watching a red pillar um, 
and I called my dad. I was like, hey, uh, I have to ask you a question for work. Have you ever cheated on mom? And my dad was like, okay. And I was like, I know this is like offensive, but I just need to know, you know? And he was like, okay, first of all, not offensive. Cause no, I haven't cheated on your mother. Cause I am a good man. You know who cheats on their wives? Rats, men who are rats. And then like, he was like, cause my dad spends like all his time with us, you know, mm -hmm. like he did growing up. And even, um, I remember I said, um, like YouTubers were reviewing one of the things I said about my parents. And I said, my parents don't fight. Like they don't demean each other. They don't physically touch each other. They don't call each other names. When my parents fight, it's over the thing they're fighting about, not at each other. So that was what yes. was mimicked to me as a child. And somebody was like, she's not with her parents 24 seven. She doesn't know that. My parents have an open door policy for their kids. Their adult children, three of them still live at home. Mm -hmm. My parents do not spend time alone. They like their kids. So we spend a lot of time with our parents and we've seen them argue. Like we grew up our whole life watching our parents argue. It was like popcorn. When mom and dad were arguing, we sat on the couch and we watched them and we figured out like dynamics because my parents weren't going to hide it from us. Like they wanted mm. to see, they wanted us to see them problem solve. Mm. And it was really cool to see. So we're really lucky in that way that we got to see adults problem solve. We got to be involved yeah. in the problem solving which I know a lot of cultures like have this thing where like kids are meant to be seen, not heard. We were allowed oh, to yes. have opinions. Like we were asked, like, what do you think about this thing happening during the election? What do you think about this philosophy thing? What do you think about this religious thing? We mm. were asked at little ages, like little, mm. you know? And so that gave us like a sense of, we were allowed to have opinions. So we were, you know, again, this like little bubble that gave me borderline also gave me a great foundation. <laughs> so funny, yes. huh? So that's yeah. And they raised us. Some of my brothers, most of my siblings are not married. Obviously only three of us are married. Seven of my mother's children are not married. And one of them is in his forties and he's waiting. He's waiting for that perfect wife. And mm -hmm. genuinely he gets women. Women want to marry him, but he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, I like my life. I like my apartment. I like my job. I like my life. And if I invite a woman into my life, she and I have to make a life together. And I'm not going to ruin my life for someone who's going to make it worse because he doesn't want to get divorced. Like my parents always said, better to be single than divorced. Mm. And I believe that. Better to be single than divorced. Not that I'm talking bad about divorces, you know, but better to be single than divorced. You know what I'm saying? So I think with that mentality, I was given the right to be single. Like, I don't feel any pressure. The only pressure my parents give me is to have kids. And as I just broke it to them that I'm thinking about not having kids in a very serious way. Oh, that's another thing I want to tell you before I go into my second thing. So, OK, hold on. I'm trying not to lose my train of thought. On our first date, I told my partner, I said, hey, just heads up. I've always wanted kids my whole life. And if you had met me seven months ago, I would have wanted six kids, but I just got, you know, I'm in diagnosis process. I haven't been diagnosed yet, but they think it's autoimmune. And I have now mourned the idea of being a mother. And so there is a chance I will not want kids. So I need you to be open to life because I want, I haven't closed that door yet, but I need you to be also okay with the fact that I might choose not to be a mother. <laughs> and you know, for a fact on a first date, that is a huge deal breaker for lots of people. And so... It was a combination of things where like if he had met me two years before and we had kids, I would have had kids. My body would have been healthy. I would have been really strong. I would have had those kids. But he met me when I was sick and he met me now where I'm not getting better. And I'm also I've lost my desire to be a mother. It went away. And I'm 35 in May. So we're probably not going to have kids, bro. And that would absolutely be a deal breaker for so many people who want legacy, who want kids. I needed yeah. to marry someone who didn't care about legacy. Because, like, I don't care what happens when we die. But mm -hmm. people who have kids often care about producing that legacy, right? So, again, yes. when we talk about settling, it would have been a settle. Let's say a person who wanted kids really badly settled for me and thought, well, I love Britney, so I'll just do it. I would have felt devastated that they settled for me and lost their chance to have kids. Mm -hmm. versus my husband who's like I'm here for you and if we get kids great if we don't get kids great mm -hmm. and I was like okay dope that's how I feel yeah so when I think about settling I also think about the person that settled for me and how devastating that would be for them you know I don't know if people always think about that other person as well sometimes I think people who settle just think like oh, at least I have security at least I have a husband who pays the bills at least I have a wife who puts out but what about them bro yes you know Definitely. Definitely. 
yeah, that's very true. Ah. It's just, is, is humanity as a species ready to have that, that, that real reckoning oh. with itself? No. That's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. No, I think we're yeah. like, we're evolving and we're doing pretty good socially, but we're still working on it. Um, do you have any thoughts before I move on to this thing I wrote, wrote down? No, you, you, you sort of said everything okay. that I think like I, I, I felt definitely. Okay. So going back to what you said earlier, it stood out to me, like wanting a partner and wanting this thing and the self-love. So my brain categorizes everything. Like where does something come from? So, um, this does like, when I asked you, um, how often do you like sit at home and see yourself, like give yourself that ability or that time? And you said never, um, do do you feel like that's a choice or do you think that's like your journey? Like, are you a believer in like, that's a choice I'm making or you think like, this is just like my story? I think it's a choice I'm making out of sort of fear. Mm. I think it's definitely a sort of a fear response and it's just safety. Uh, I think I'm afraid of what I might find or discover of myself. True. Um, and I think I really have a very like sort of low regard for myself that it's sort of easier for me to concentrate, I think, on sort of uh, the externalities, not just literally like sort of going out into the world and like just l living in the real world and not sort of sitting at home and sort of self-reflecting and everything, except when I have like an hour of therapy, um, but also just... Um, like objectively in terms of like going to the gym, focusing on like how I look on the outside, mm -hmm. makeup, all these sorts of things. I think it really, um, I don't necessarily, necessarily see these things as enhancing me as like the person that I am. I see it more so as sort of a distraction from having to deal with that or having to reckon with that. Sure. Um, so yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's sort of out of fear of what I might find. Definitely. Yeah. Can I ask if it's not too personal, like, how does that make you feel? Like, I'm, I'm hearing, like, a really great description. I'm, like, you've thought about it. How does it make you feel, I guess, to know that about yourself? Pretty shit, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily feel good about it. Sure. I think I sort of really do recognize, like, when I'm, like, at the gym and I'm, like, on, like, a step marathon machine and everything and like sweating and everything like I don't feel like I'm doing it for me I feel like I'm doing it because I'm trying to look good to like attract women to me or whatever so it's it's sort of it's, it's I'm very sort of aware that I'm doing these things not because it makes me feel good in myself exactly or sort of like is sort of self-affirming yeah um that it is sort of both a distraction from sort of the real issues that I have and dealing with that and reckoning with that. Um, and also just, I think it's also in a way it's easier. It's easier as well. I find yeah. it easier, you know, because, you know, looks seem to matter, especially at this point in life. Like uh, it seems to be like everybody cares about looks. And so, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's an easier option. Definitely. Yeah. Do you care about looks? Uh, I do, but I think in like a different way. Like I, I'm not attracted to youthful beauty. Um, mm. I've never been attracted to that. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I was quote unquote saved all my life by various foster parents who were all older white women. Sure. So I think that it has a lot to do with that and sort of seeing, um, sort of being enamored with these women yeah. and sort of feeling loved and secure and safe and at home with them. Um, that's really has drawn me toward that. And I sort of associate my youth, especially with like low self-confidence, low self-worth, trivialities, sort of being really insecure about everything. And I see that in other people just in like different ways, not as like, I, I wouldn't say like as bad as me in most cases, but I do see that. Um, you know, just in like simple things, like when I go to the roller disco rink with all these young people, like I'm always the first one skating because they're all too afraid to skate. And it's like, yeah. that is just like the most unattractive thing to me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you absolute 
pussies you know so it's like sort yeah. of like even like little things like that I think that I sort of um so yeah I would say that looks do matter to me but it's it's you know I, I recognize like when I'm attracted to a woman mm. and it's always like an older woman who I'm attracted to and it's yeah. because of things like sort of I guess sort of physically like seeing like she's lived life or like seeing like distinct smile lines things like that mm. um so yeah I, I'd say it matters to me but sort of in a bit of a different way yeah Are you do you think like the the aesthetic of her being slightly older or like well rounded also means like she could take on some sort of like mentor kind of romantic relationship with you are you looking for like a an older woman to like guide you through life or are you looking for somebody to to build life with you who's on the same level as you <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And that's something that I have sort of reckoned with myself a bit because I have noticed that when I sort of imagine who I am, like when I'm like 45 and like living my best life and have like the self-confidence of like, you know, a Russian bear that <laughs> I sort of notice in myself that my partner is sort of at the same sort of age as me as well. Mm -hmm. So then that makes me think, oh, well, it, it mustn't just be like sort of, I guess, like a, a, a fetish, I guess, for like sort of mm. an older woman. Because when I'm older, I see myself as being with a woman who's older like me. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're sort of on the same level and things like that. And so that's helped me to like sort of open up to like um, dating or like speed dating, especially younger people. Yeah. Um, but also I don't want to date somebody for their potential mm. because that doesn't work Amen. and I can't control how somebody's going to be in the future. So I'm not doing that either. Totally. But I think I have found that it's been helpful for me to sort of not just look at older people as sort of like put them on a pedestal because I mean, when I see like Gen X's and boomers online, they're just as stupid as Gen Z is like just in their own way. So totally. it's, I don't necessarily associate being older with more wisdom, but I do associate it with what I see as greater confidence, which I really am very attracted to. Totally. Um, and I see that as being something that's very sort of much of like people as they go through life, mm -hmm. that sort of people start to really cut out the bullshit and start to really like figure things out and realize that a lot of things that we think are so important when we're young like you know he has to be like six foot or more and like you know extensions are the most important thing and everything that suddenly these things are just like this is all just a lie like this totally. is it's not important um so i think that's what i've i find attractive and sort of older people more so. yeah 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 that's yeah. so funny because i i have like this whole rant I go on about age gap relationships if the younger person is in their 20s and there's like a 10 year gap then I'm always like what do these older people want these younger people and then I feel like the younger people I know including myself when I was younger I wanted somebody who was like more confident and like had their life established and could show me some stuff about life but then I realized like I fell out of interest for people that were way older than me as I aged and I realized mm. like I just wanted somebody in my same generational understanding so we could be similar um yeah and we could age together. And also that is sort of like my parents' belief, like find somebody within five years of you if possible. So you have mm. the most in common. Um, mm. And, you know, I feel like that was pr – I've always dated within like five or ten or twelve years of me. And the twelve years one was crazy because by the time I aged out, I looked at him and I was like, why are you dating me? Mm. Why are you interested in me? Like I – you're like a kid. Why are you dating me? And then I realized like, oh, you don't want to mature. Like you're almost 40 and you're not – anywhere you should be near 40 like in terms yeah. of maturity and look I'm gonna watch anime for the rest of my life so part of me is always gonna be a kid I acknowledge this okay <laughs> but I want to also be a kid in the same way that my partner is like he loves anime I love anime but like we don't want to be kids when it comes to like our social life like I don't have the youthful resolve my knees will give out if I try to go clubbing at this point in my life and even though I love it for everybody else I need to be in bed y'all so I love that but I see mm -hmm. these people in their 40s and 50s at clubs and I love that for them but like I I don't think I could <laughs> do that and I love it I really no judgment like if you want to be Jeffree Star and wear fucking makeup and all this shit when you're old I love that it's such a vibe I love your Instagram but also I wear makeup only for streaming, girl, this is it. Some eyeliner, some lipstick, and some whatever, mascara, whatever. Something simple. I don't want to mm -hmm. do that in my real life. Like, in my real life, I don't wear makeup. And I asked my mm -hmm. husband, I was like, you good? Like, I don't wear makeup in real life, bro. 
I tried that when I was younger. I just don't vibe with it. Like, I don't wear makeup in real life. And he was like, nah, I don't care. And I was like, okay, because, like, your wife's going to show up to events. And I don't wear makeup. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm opposed to it. I just, like, do I have to? I'll wear it if I have mm-hmm. to. But, like, I don't want to. Not yeah. because I hate it, by the way. I love my Kat Von D palettes. I love the makeup I own. I, again, mm-hmm. it's like, what is my lifestyle? Yes. And I'm just asking that, like, what is our lifestyle? So I've noticed that some people will get really upset with me because they're like, what's wrong with age gap relationships? Nothing, my bros. Who cares what Brittany thinks? I'm just asking if you know why you're in them, especially if you're 22 exactly. dating a 45-year-old. I just want to know. That's important. Is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Like, well, I've got two points. Actually, I'll start with the first one. First one, do you know that influencer called Julia Zolg? Yeah, the gay one, the gay bisexual, fa- p- oh, big gay. Pink hair. Yeah, yes. yeah, that one. I know her. You know she's married to a woman who's like in her sixties and oh, everything. Oh, but I covered her, and they were really mad how I covered her. But toxic, re- that is a toxic ass fucking relationship. Uh, I'm so glad you know about this because I thought that I was. I thought like in my mind when I was going through this whole like discovery of myself, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like Julia Zolg. Like this is. I'm I'm going to be with like an older woman. Like this is this is this is who I am. Mm-hmm. And watching that sort of trajectory and sort of the unraveling of that whole relationship and like Girl. sort of this thing of it really like it 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 did something to my mind about mm-hmm. this whole thing and made me like think like really seriously about this. Like um, I guess sort of like I guess the idealization that I sort of had and do somewhat still have for like older women. Yeah, but also like. Th- you know, is, is that something that I like sort of want? Like in my mind, I want an older woman because of everything that I like um, associate with an older woman. But is that what I need? Like when I think of like all of my needs of what I need in a relationship, what I need yeah. in a partner, like it, 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 it does that actually compute? Does that actually align? And it really doesn't. I think that's that's what I can see in that relationship, at mm. least in so far as it's like on social media. Right, right, right. It's it's just there. There just isn't that sort of alignment. I I think, and I think it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, to say the very least. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I've also found that the second thing I was just going to say is like sort of when it comes to age gap relationships. My only serious relationship that I've had with a woman that I was in a relationship with, it was when I was. I was, I think I was 20 or 21 and she was 46. Damn. And That's an age gap. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. And it really wasn't what I thought it was going to be mm-hmm. either. Um, but because I was very much one of those people who's like, stick it out to the end. I waited mm-hmm. until she broke up with me. And that sort of, I think for me, sort of like made me sort of, close up of my sense of um being attracted to women a lot yeah. because of how that all ended and how that experience was which wasn't a good experience um and yes yeah i've always dated people older than me i think because of that sort of pursuing of that ideal of what being older means totally um relatable yeah yeah which relatable. it isn't actually i mean yeah yeah, yeah like if Look at Eileen and Julia. <laughs> yeah, literally. And what a mess. I will say, what, I don't know what's worse. So when I hear like one of the red flags I hear in age gap relationships, when the partner's older is the way the partner talks about the younger partner. I remember when is your your age. I can't wait till you're my age. Oh, you'll learn that life lesson eventually. Like, oh, you're so cute. Oh, isn't that cute? You're figuring out like how to, and I'm like, are you talking down to your partner? What is happening? Mm. And then vice versa, where your partner is younger and they look at the older partner like, Oh my God, am I your mom? Am I going to take care of you? It's like, stop. I want a teammate. And my teammate got to be on a similar page. Like we can be a little bit here. We can be here, but we cannot be here. Like this, not even close. Like I'm okay with like this. Like I like us to be like this. So Mm -hmm. as one of us excels, one of us pulls each other up. But if like it's all the way down here, that's just, it's going to, it's not going to work. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like my partner and I had to be on the exact same page. It's that my partner and I had to be in the same ish place in life. So no matter the direction we went in, we could technically grow together now. Like we yeah. had grown as people. Like, again, if I had met him just a few years prior, we would have been way off. Mm-hmm. But then now we're like here. So it's like, oh, cool. Now I can like we can pull each other up if one of us. And I never look at my partner and think I'm his mom. I never look at my partner and think like how sweet one day you'll be smarter oh my god am i smarter than you like i don't want to deal with someone who i feel like in any way parental 
I want to feel like a teammate. So when we're both dumb, we're both dumb. And I'm like, oh my God, we're idiots. We should call our moms. And like, I love it when we're both on the phone with our moms. And I'm like, call your mom. She'll know what to do, bro. And like, it kind of feels good that we're both like figuring out adulthood so, sort of in a similar way or at a similar point. And so I think like in that regard, it makes me feel like, okay, I've got a real teammate here and we're going to, we're going to excel together. Now I'm not, again, you guys do your relationships the way you want to do them. I don't give a fuck. But I will say that I also look at the level of what I think is like toxicity in a relationship. And I do think we're all born dysfunctional on a spectrum. Like I think I was born into dysfunction, but it wasn't as bad as like some people got it. And it wasn't as good as some people got it. Okay. So compared to somebody, somebody's life is harder, easier. I look at my relationship similarly where I'm like, okay, out of all the healthy relationships I see, okay, I can see like places in which we are dealing with our own individual dysfunction and we're trying very hard not to let it go into the relationship itself. So like mm -hmm. I've got stuff I work on, he has stuff he works on, but this is the first relationship I've had where I feel like he doesn't make his shit my shit, but he still asks me for support. I still ask him for support and we're mm -hmm. certainly not punished for it. Like the other day I was having like a neurodivergent meltdown and I was like, oh my God, if I did it a red pillar, they would be like, my wife is sick and I don't know what to do. And she's mentally ill. And like, I hate this. And like I dated somebody who was neurodivergent. I married someone neurodivergent. So he's like, ah, oh, cool. Having an ND breakdown. I was like, oh my God, it's the worst. And like, I'm overstimulated. And I'm like, I can't think. And he just sits there and thinks it's funny. Like we just sit there and he, he like knows exactly what to do because like he just sees it as a part of like, yeah, this is life. Like this is a part of that. It's not perfect, but it's not about like punishing each other for it. Like I'll say, I'm very sorry. I'm so low on spoons. I might snap at you, but I love you so much. So maybe we shouldn't talk for the next 10 minutes. And like we usually just talk to each other. He'll say like, I think that hurt my feelings. I'm open to discussing it in 10 minutes. And I'm like, okay. And like that's how we'll talk. Or like he ran into the room the other day. He's like, I got to tell you something, but it might hurt your feelings. And I was like, I'm ready. And he's like, you've gotten fat. And I was like, I knew it. <laughs> and like, we'll talk about it. And like, we'll openly, we'll warn each other. You know, yes. we're trying to comfort, we're trying to love each other, but we're trying to stay honest. But being honest, let me tell you, we've had some of the most vulnerable conversations I've ever had in my life. And it has tested my desire for honesty. I'm like, oh, hmm. mm -hmm. okay. I asked for an honest relationship. That was very honest. Wow. Okay, that was a very honest moment for us. And like, it is, I can understand why people don't want it. It is like sometimes the weirdest thing to hear another human being say their most honest thoughts. But I'll tell you, I'm also ready for it. I don't think I was ready in the past if I'm going to be real with you. Mm -hmm. I think hearing the truth was like too much because I personally feel like my trauma and my neurodivergency had been so misunderstood by myself by my own self that I couldn't allow honesty for someone else to come in without it incredibly shattering me. Yes. So at this stage in my life, I think I always say like, I'm so glad he met me after therapy because he gets the best version of myself. Like, I'm so glad I met him now. I got the best version of him that mm -hmm. could have been the best version up until this moment. But like my twenties, Brittany girl, she just wasn't ready to be someone's wife, you know? She wasn't ready. Yeah. She really wasn't. She wanted to be so badly. She wanted to be a mom. She wanted to be so many things, but she wasn't fucking ready. She wasn't mm. ready to truly like respect the individual consciousness and asking what it meant to ask someone to make a life with her. Yeah. I was just living my poly days out and having fun and thinking I was falling in love with like, you know what I mean? And just like, I don't know, dreaming about some harem <laughs> on a farm. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Figuring it out, I guess. Yes. Yes. I relate to that directly. Like I want the relationship. I want that like serious monogamous relationship till death does part. Yeah. But I'm not at that point in my life where I'm ready for that. I'm not the, I'm not the person that the person who I want in my life is looking for right now. I'm, I'm not, I'm not what they need nor what they want. Yeah. And so, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful that see taking into consideration them, I think is what's missing. And I love that you just said that because it's exactly exactly what's been on my mind this week where I'm like, they are also like, I'm trying to think of like, because I asked my my ex ex one of my ex partners, I asked him, I was like, 
I was looking at him and I was like, why are you dating me? And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, I don't always treat you the best. Don't you think it's a red flag that you're dating somebody who doesn't treat you very well sometimes? And he was like, what do you mean? That's just how relationships are. And I was like, no, you does like you don't deserve. I don't believe in deserve. You should want someone who treats you better than I treat you. And I should want to be a person who treats my partner better than I'm treating you. So I need to go to therapy. I need to get my shit in order. Something's wrong. And like, I remember looking at him and thinking bad of him for dating me. Oh, because I was like, oh, I think less of you for dating me because I was at my, at my toxic conservative stage and I refused to go to therapy and I refused to get help and I refused to admit something was severely wrong until I lost my job. And I was like, mm. Brittany doesn't lose money. Cause a lot of myself, like my fulfillment is like my ability to maintain a work and maintain a place. That's how mm -hmm. I know I'm okay. It's like, do I have an apartment? Yes. Do I have a job? I'm good. And when I lose one of those two things, I'm like, something's wrong. Something's wrong. What's wrong. And I thought it was him, but it was my mental health that chose him. Mm. He thought it like I was, or no, he thought my mental health was the problem, but it wasn't my mental health. It was my. My mental health was picking him. I see. Do you I get see. it? So like yeah. when I got better, yeah. the irony is he encouraged me to go to therapy. When I got better, I dumped him. And the more I got better, the more I stayed away from him yes. and officially cut him out. And the irony was he was like, I thought therapy was going to make you choose me. I was like, nope. Therapy made me realize my mental health was picking you. Mm. And so like when I decided to pick myself, now that was my journey of self-love. As I did, I disappeared from the internet for six months. I'm sure you know this story. And I went to go live with my brother on the farm. And then I asked myself, like, what do I actually want? Like, me. Not the world. Fuck the world. Me. What do I want? And yeah, it's really not what the world wants, bro. I don't want the same thing the world wants. The only part that the world and I share in commonality is I want love. I want stability. And I want everyone to treat each other with dignity. The dilemma is that's a little vague. Yes. So that was one of the problems. What do yes. you think? Because I think you're so individualistic ultimately, even though you're community hopping right now. And I love that for you. What <laughs> overlap with society do you think you have? Um, if it's not going to be within a community, like I just named mine, what do you think you universally share with like the world in terms of wants and needs? Um, I think I overlap with like, like in terms of, I guess, sort of my beliefs, my own personal beliefs that sort of overlap with like the wider society. Um, I guess sort of, um, I think even though I'm, I doubt that I will have children if, if I could have children, if I can have children, I doubt I'd have children because I don't. I would not be a good mother to a child and I don't want to do that to somebody. Um, but I think that I, I definitely do see children as sort of integral. I think that they should be protected at all costs. I sort sure. of am very much one of those, those people who's very much a sort of, you know, I see a baby and I'm like enamored and I think this is like so pure and beautiful and this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened. And, you know, everything like that. Um, even though in my personal life, children do not feature like whatsoever. So I think that that's an overlap. I think I definitely see an overlap in sort of the importance of um, having two parents uh, in a home raising children. I think that's very important. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like they can be like two of any parents. I don't like that really doesn't matter. But it, it's sort of I, I do see that as like really important. I think that yes. sort of if I'd had that, it would have really altered, I think, a lot of my opinions and perspectives and sort of aversions and trauma responses to especially men sort of having like sort of a father or a father figure. I think that would have been really integral to sort of a lot of my own personal development um, and also seeing like a working relationship between two people um, and sort of modeling myself off of that. I think sure. that's really important for a lot of children to sort of figure out life and everything. And I think in general, I do see religion as a very good thing. I see it as an overall, like, sort of net positive. I think sort of religion and that sort of, like, community of having those people, that sort of community who you're sort of, you not just, like, sort of projecting yourself in this world, but, like, with the hope of sort of, like, future or, like, otherworldly um, 
paradise uh, or sort of fulfillment. Uh, I think that really feeds something in a lot of people and sort of gives them their quote unquote spoons to like carry on in life in a world that is often very hostile to a lot of people. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I respect a lot of sort of the values and the moral messaging from I think religion just in general, which tends to be sort of the same when you sort of strip down like, you yeah. know, the language and everything. But yes, yeah. So I think yeah, I'd say that those are like the main three things that I really sort of I see my own values as really aligning with yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, weird question, but I just thought about it. So it might I might be phrasing it incorrectly, but oh, this is gonna sound so weird. How much of the ideas you have about the world so far are rooted in a lived experience of a bubble or a perception of the bubble. So like you say, religion's like a net good. How much of that is from a lived experience and a perceived experience? Like how much, does that kind of make sense? Does that, did I word that right? Yeah, yes. I think it's been difficult for me to get to that point because I was very religious as a child. Right, right, right. And then I gave up on God after my um, foster parent died. And that was like the end of that. And I did not believe in that. Sorry, how and old were you that, when that happened? I, I was 13 when she, like 12, 13 when she died. Yeah, um, yeah that's rough. And it was like a very, very long process, like years um, of like just watching this deterioration when God was meant to save her. Um, and so that sort of decimated my religious faith. Um, and I'd say that I went to atheism and now I'd say that I'm far more theological than religious um, and far more theological than atheistic about yeah. things. Yeah. Um, I sort of see like the moral value, I guess, in religion. And I sort of see a world that is sort of lacking in that kind of, I'd say that philosophy and that shared philosophy. And I think that that's really, I think that's where I personally find like sort of the ability to go on in life with hope, especially and faith um even when i don't have any reassurance that my faith or my hope is going to be met by anything concrete or meaningful in this life yeah um and i think everybody needs that to an extent really and truly like needs that um so yes i would say that now lived experience i would say yes it is informed by lived experience but not sort of in that sort of straightforward way of i've been religious or i'm religious and therefore I see that value. Uh, I'd say it's sort of, I've, I've lost my religiosity, but I see the value in that because I think of like my life now and when I was a child in South Africa and like my childhood in South Africa was like, it was, it was sad, like with like so much trauma and everything, but I was like living in the glory of God and this was the mm. destiny of God. And so there was a purpose to all this suffering and all this heartache. There was a purpose Ooh, to mm -hmm. none of these people loving me or wanting to keep me there yeah. was a purpose to my mother abandoning me there's a purpose that i don't that my brother and i were separated like there's a purpose to this abuse yeah. like it made i was able to like live with it whereas now i found that like since i moved to the uk and like i'd given up on god and everything like i found out so much about myself like this whole world has opened up to me like i would have never even thought that uh, that there was even such a thing as a lesbian if i was still in south africa like, to be honest i'd probably be married kids and everything oh damn and it's sort of like this whole world has opened up to me but I'm so sad mm. and sort of it, it's made me like very I'd say negative uh it's very hard for me to be optimistic mm. I can only be patient and have faith and hope and that's mainly because I read a lot of Dostoevsky and so like I just have to <laughs> that's sort of where my sort of theology comes from more than yeah. anything else um and so yeah yeah i would say that yeah I, I, I yeah i'd say that it's informed by my own personal lived experiences but mm -hmm. like not directly definitely yeah. not yeah that's funny because you were talking and i was like oh it reminds me of peterson and peterson loves just like he loves yes. him so like it's yeah. kind of cute but actually i thought <laughs> 
what you just explained was like the perfect model I use for why people love bubbles and why I love a bubble and why I created a bubble versus finding a community one is like I loved growing up religious because I really believed and then I fell out of religion about 19 and when I came out of religion it was like oh what now and then I bubble hopped and bubble hopped and bubble hopped and I was like man people really missing religion and they're really missing a community like the thing science says uh, community consistency structure right we're missing this thing but more than that I realized um, I was the thing that changed that church stayed the same, community stayed the same. I'm so sick of hearing fucking red pillars talk about how like, you know, we used to have religion. There's, it's still there. You changed. You're the thing that didn't go back to religion. And so I had to ask myself like, uh -huh. I changed. Religion stayed. The Vatican's still there, girl. It's right next door. I could, I could just hop over, go see, you know, the Pope right now. It's a joke, but like, you know what I mean? Yes. And <laughs> I'm not doing it. Like, my mom will ask me, like, why don't you go, Batsy, to the Vatican and see the incorruptibles? Why don't you go to Croatia's miracles of the Catholic Church? Why don't you go prove, like, your relationship with God? And I'm like, I don't have a relationship with God anymore. Mm -hmm. I changed. And my mom goes, I wish you were that 10-year-old who loved God again. I was like, you know, um, I can't be. You can't go back. You can't live in the past. You got to be the present you. So who knows? Maybe Brittany at 45 goes back to the Catholic Church. My husband has my consent if I ever become religious again to get me evaluated in case I've lost my mind. Um, That's a would be... conversation to have as well. That's so important. Yes. Well, see, we've so had that conversation important. because mm. I know for other couples, like, they would think it was beautiful that, like, their, you know, wife came home one day maybe and, like, you know, had a religi religious moment. But, like, my husband has my consent to get me evaluated because that would be very out of character for who I am as a person. Very possible, but very weird. And, um... Hold on, religiosity, Peterson, living with a bubble. Oh, so what you just described is why I think the journey into introspection is so difficult in, in conjunction to what you said before about like facing yourself. And this is why I say it could almost make you go insane because you have to shatter all of the little bit of protection you've given yourself to like even find this new version of yourself. And then we usually wait for people to do it with us. So we have some sort of like thing to rely on. But the difficult part is like, I really do think introspection is a solo journey, even if you're partnered. Like my partner and I often talk about our introspection journeys with each other. And I'm like, where are you at? Where am I at? Where are you at? It, we can't do it together because yeah. that's our extrospection journey. Yeah, we're doing life together, but whatever he's, you know, whatever we're battling within ourselves, like I can't battle it for him. He can't battle mine for me. So it feels so difficult even when you're in a marriage to realize like fuck I gotta meditate on my own hold on I have to discover this on my own and so I wonder when you think about your journey and then I know you watch my content do you ever like I guess hear my journey or like a journey adjacent stories and think to yourself like oh I wonder if I'm gonna like do this thing and face myself or if I'm going to like wait, but like, do you ever think like that version that you, of you that's 40, does she, does she face herself by herself or does she not decide to do that? Like, do you ever try to think like you, does that make sense? Does that story make sense? Yeah, that, that makes question? sense. Yes. No, she doesn't. She f faces a lot of other things and does okay. a lot of other things which make her sort of, uh, appear a lot more convincingly like confident reassured sort of with purpose and direction but ultimately that's found in sort of connecting with somebody a like significant other who's going to sort of really help with that ability to like open up and be vulnerable be honest and be uh self-aware and introspective to like have i guess the safety of sort of whatever i find when i do that that there's there, there's sort of like that person cradling me in a way like sort of totally. figuratively speaking um because i don't see myself relative to you you have like a confidence that i don't have and that i really do not see myself ever having on my own that i could have on my own mm -hmm. and so i can't see myself doing that in the way that i've seen you do that with your journey and everything that you've said sure. if that makes sense yeah no, that's okay. This is where I struggle because Robert Sapolsky's work, I've been covering it and he's um the determinist. He's a scientist who believes like we're all determined and our biology is what determines, mm. uh, he believes in determinism. So I've been thinking about this and I wonder, and this is a very philosophy question. So like now we're, we're analyzing, we're like not making it personal. 
even though I'm going to mention something personal. Our, were me and Z, when we were like little embryos, did we grow up with like a specific like genetic predisposition to like personality types and then born into the bubbles we're born into. And then we were always determined to never have that path. And so we can't take the same path no matter what. Like, could you change the path? Or no, like this was always going to be yours. And then could I have been anyone other than me? Like, could I have ever been anything? But my mom says I was this confident, this arrogant when I was like four years old. Like, I've always been this way. So like, I didn't even win the lottery in any way. I just like, yeah, this is me. And Robert would say, Brittany did not earn this. Brittany just was. She was always going to be this person. And Z didn't deserve this or earn this. This was always going to be who Z was. Like, do you subscribe to that at all? Do you feel that for your life and your journey? I do with certain things, but not with other things. Like my, I, I do feel that a lot of like how my journey has changed and changed direction and like sort of altered course has been mainly because of other people. So like the only reason... I got into Cambridge and like f did everything I did to get into Cambridge was because my guardian, my new guardian told me that I'd never get into Cambridge or Oxbridge. Ooh, I love I was a like, determined bitch. Oh, I love uh, a rebel. Yeah. I love a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that that's what I really feed off of. Like when, when it, it's sort of from other people telling me that I can't do something or you will never be a millionaire something. and you will never be married. Oh, okay. Challenge accepted. Definitely. Is <laughs> he <laughs> about to be rich, y'all? <laughs> and married. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I definitely, I do find myself sort of feeding a lot off of that mm. in order to change my direction and prove people wrong with okay, that. Okay, love it. So like, I find that that when people say, oh, you're black, so you're oppressed because that is just the state of black people. Like you're mm. oppressed. You're going to be a victim. Like you're never going to like get out of like, you know, quote unquote poverty or whatever. I'm like, well, you'll be surprised. Watch me yeah. like yeah, wait yeah. a second. But like, you know, when you wait a second, you'll see. And so I really thrive off of that. Um, I think in like altering my direction. Um, but I think that those are things that I found that I've really had, I guess, I guess I've had a belief just because I've seen other people do that in the world and I've seen other people do that. But oh, when it comes sure. to personal things of mine that are really sort of like looking at my personal history of like everything that's happened, I don't see other people like that. Like I don't see other people who've been like interracially adopted and then fostered or fostered then adopted then fostered again in like post apartheid South Africa. Mm. I don't see other people who've like been through like certain things that I've gone through so I don't sort of have like a model that I can sort of see okay so that's you can do that that can work out um or like you can find sort of like confidence in yourself and like how you look and your identity um and so I don't really know what to look for sort of evidence that I can then follow suit from mm -hmm. um and so I find that quite difficult Definitely. I think that's, that's sort of, for me, is like a whole different can of worms to like everything else that yeah. I can sort of see, model, and prove someone wrong or mm -hmm. prove something wrong. Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh. I mean, I think that for me that I love a good challenge. And now I say my biggest competition is myself, and I'm very competitive. Actually, mm -hmm. one of the rules in my marriage is we don't compete because we're both okay. very competitive, and we will destroy this marriage if we compete against each other. <laughs> Because both of us will want to win. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we win like very – so even like the other day, I don't remember what it was, but we started competing and we're like, because like we will destroy everything in order to win. And so I was like, I only compete against myself, especially when it comes to work. I don't even compete against other YouTubers. I tell myself, no, 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 you're not my competition. I'm my competition because mm -hmm. I don't want to also look at my fellow friends or coworkers as like I'm competing against them. Oh, I can't believe they got more subscribers than me. No. I'm only in competition with myself. I find that my competitiveness, when it especially comes out, when people are like, you can't do something, I'm like, what? Like, I have that too. Like, it feels like there's a fuel of fire that lights up under my butt. And I'm like, I, I can't. Just, but okay, this is, and I'm not, I don't mean to project this onto you. I think 
it's my some people in my audience call it my PDA, my pathological de demand avoidance. When people make a demand of me, I want to do the opposite. And then when people tell me I can't do something, I'm like, what did you say? What is happening? And then I'm like, so then I'm like, is it my neurodivergency? Is it like my desire to prove myself? Is it my desire to prove myself to me? Or is it my reassurance too? Because I want to know I'm capable. Mm. Just for my own sake as well. But also I hate when people like, okay, I can't tell if this is my possible autism, my neurodivergency or my arrogance. But when people are like, Women don't ask for raises. I was like, give me a raise. When women, when they're like, women don't ask men out. I'm like, I like you. I will ask you out now. Like, cause I will just, I'm doing the opposite. People tell me like women aren't ever good enough. They, they only want men for their money. I was like, I'll make more money than you. So then I get confused about the social script too, because I'm like, so you don't want me to make more money than you? They're like, no. But I was like, but then you complained that women only want you for your money. And then I realized like those men, I was never going to date them anyways. Mm -hmm. See, my mistake mm -hmm. was thinking those were my husbands or my even my wives, but like they were never going to be my spouses mm. because my partner is going to give a fuck who makes the money. My partner is going to give a fuck if we win. We want to win. True. You know, and so I realized like I do have True. a competitive streak in me, but so do all my siblings. Like right now there's like seven, no, five, five of us, I think in a bet. By the time one of my younger brothers turns 30, whoever has the most net worth gives everyone, everyone gets $1,000 from that person. So I'm going to be either about to lose 1000 or make 5000 <laughs> And right now, girl, I'm going to lose 1000 okay? I'm second place <laughs> and I'm nowhere near first place. The first place brother is so much farther ahead than all of us. And we're all just looking at him like, <sighs> he's so annoying. And he has four fucking kids. Yo, his net worth is wild. I'm like, I hate you, bro. And we're counting. Oh my goodness. We're counting inheritance, and he's gonna get an inheritance from somebody who he's been very good to and had a great relationship with, not related to us, of quite the amount. And I'm like, oh wow, quite the oh, amount, wow. which is great. What a blessing. Like that just, that's just like pure. Like he really like that. If that person decides to go through with what they've said, like they, it couldn't have gone to a better person. But, mm -hmm. like, it is one of those things where, like, that was a part of his karma building, honestly. He, he, everything he's put into his life, it makes sense that he's getting all this goodness back. He's a very good person. Yes. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I look at, wait, what was that about? Hold on. I deviated. Oh, wanting to win teammates, values, competition. Even when I'm in comp competition with my siblings, bro, ultimately I'm still in competition with myself, right? Because who's going to make my net worth double more than me? It's not really them. It's me. So I kind of like the idea of using other people to make yourself compete with yourself. But then I have to ask the question eventually, do you think you'll run out of people to compete with? Hmm. That's interesting because I, I, I don't, just on that first point, I, I, I don't agree that it's like you competing with yourself. Like I, I don't think so. Tell me. Like really. Because I think the value comes in there being other people, the value of the competition, sort of the essence and the meaning of the competition. Otherwise it's just sort of an empty meaning. It's just a definition, but sort of like the integral meaning of that definition comes from the other people. It's like what I think, like I did a thought experiment with myself. Like if I was, the, if I woke up and I was the only person on earth, would I wear makeup? Would I get my hair done? Yeah. I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, it's not a me thing, like, at all. It's not, like, something that is, like, sort of about me or anything. It's, it's about everybody else, like, really. No matter how much I say that I'm doing this for me and, mm -hmm. like, this is, like, all about my confidence and my everything. Like, it's, it's for everybody else, I think, at the end of the day. So... I think when I run out of people, and if I ran out of people then it would all just be meaningless to me. Oh. I, I don't think that there would be that same kind of meaning in it. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very dependent on other people. I don't think that I can be or am an island, and I don't think I'm convinced that other people are as much of an island as they think they are, mm -hmm. because I think ultimately their belief that they are living on this sort of island, figuratively speaking, is very much because of, like, what everybody else has fed them. That's Yes, you can live on an island. Yes, you can be on an island. Yes, it can just be you and nobody else. Mm, mm. And that's other people, ultimately. That's other people influencing that belief system in the first place. 
who have built that sort of possibility of such a belief system. Mm. Okay, I will agree with you, but I'll expand it with you. Because mm -hmm. I've thought about this a lot because I went through a stage where I was convinced that if my inner circle died, like I would kill myself. And then I realized like I'm at the stage in my life where I'm like, yeah, bitches, good luck. I'm not killing myself for you. You're not that special. <laughs> and then I realized it was because I, well, I had a different relationship with myself at some point. They changed. And mm -hmm. when it changed, it changed because I realized like I really do believe we're just like animals evolved on a planet. So the idea of killing myself because everybody I love died felt really dumb because I was like, well, what does that have to do with anything? But then I realized it had everything to do with something because at some point in my life, like, well, I borderline, I have abandonment issues. And so like, I obviously didn't want to be abandoned and I wanted to be loved and I wanted my family and my inner circle. But then I realized like, as life is getting better for me, I, with knowing we're all going to die, I'm choosing to spend a lot of my time at work. Mm-hmm. So there's an experiment I do with my callers. It's one I made up for myself. And I also asked myself if nobody was on the planet, but I, I make them choose like an arena. So I have like three environments and I put them in that environment. And then I ask them questions. I put myself in a forest and I said, okay, Brittany, you're in a forest. There's no one there. What do you do? And when I asked myself, like, what do I really want? Even if nobody was there, I'm like, I have my own answer. And my answer um, people were there, people were an answer, but they were like way down the line. And then mm -hmm. I realized, cause I think you're right. I'm never alone. I'm very good at making friends. I, people like me. So I have no problem making friends, but I realized I have very little need from my friends compared to younger version of me and, or the way that media depicts friendship. Mm -hmm. So like I'm going into one of my research errors. I've noticed this. So like during COVID, some of my friendships, I could talk to them five, six, seven hours a day. And now I'm like, I don't even want to talk to you once a month because mm. I'm busy doing this thing and I'm curious about this thing. And in some way it might feel like a rejection to some people, but I need them to understand that like I need to read this book or I need to do this thing right now. Mm. And I'm going back to that forest, Brittany, who said like she really likes her friends but there's also 2000 books in the world I'd like to read before I die. So, yeah. you know, there's still things I'd like to do. So when I look at my life like that, I do think I'd be fine stuck in a library where I couldn't escape. And also I think I'd love my family. And also I really want to do this thing. And I think it's about me finding that balance between fulfilling my curiosity and maintaining my friendships. And I think that's why I don't want a friend group because as much as I love that idea, I don't want to be committed to anyone once a week and I don't want to keep it up and I don't want to have a fee like a text chain and I'm really grateful for my individual relationships. So I think like when I, I agree with you that I don't think we can be islands, but I also don't agree with people that like we need people in the way the media has convinced us we need people. Like you need to be in the same town. You need to have friends you see every weekend. You need to go out at, like, oh my God, girl. So I feel like there's some, there's got to be a balance between some of this, but I also know it feels like I know my COVID friends definitely felt rejected that I went into my like focus era. Um, but I also need them to understand that like I five, six, seven hours a day, especially now with fibro, like I don't have those spoons anymore. My body is not mm -hmm. my friend lately. So you know what I mean? So, so, so I think, do we agree that you can't be an island, but you also don't need to be yes. people all the time? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Definitely agree with that. I think I've definitely recognized that like um, recently since like moving rural, I've definitely noticed that sort of that importance of not seeing people as sort of fulfilling that sort of very stereotypical trope that we see in the media and that like sort of expectation that that really doesn't, that's not what I want. And that's, what I see of people, that's really not what they seem to want either. Yeah. yeah. But there's a lot of pressure to allegedly want that Agreed. and to like do that. Um, so yes, completely agree with that. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Especially since the world says it's like lonely and everything feels superficial. And it's like, well, it feels kind of superficial to only friends that you like. Well, not that I'm opposed to it. Like that's the thing is like, I love having superficial friends that we just talk about bowling or anime. Mm -hmm. I love that. But also that's not enough for me to necessarily like now feel like 
we're like inner circle but also even if you're inner circle like i love my sister but she'll call me she's like can you talk i was like is this an emergency she's like no i was like okay love you bye and she's like okay and like unless it's an emergency she understands like i'm living a life Mm -hmm. so even my siblings i'd like to say that we didn't we were blood related so we didn't pick each other but also we've decided as adults to pick each other because there are some siblings that don't talk to other siblings or there are some relationships where it's strained like that's a choice we were allowed to make We're all adults. We've seen our parents fight with their siblings. We know that blood does not keep you together. So Mm -hmm. we need to make the decision every day. And that's really difficult. Do you know my farm brother, who I love so much, won't Mm -hmm. recognize my husband as married to me? Because it's not religious. Right. Religious. So his kids can't call him uncle. Mm -hmm. So they call him Mr. And I'm telling right. you right now, this would end friendships. This would end sibling friendships. Because people would be like, I yes. can't believe oh, you. Yes. You're so offensive. I can't believe you're not validating my relationship. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to end my relationship with my brother. But I'm also going to make it clear to him that, like, your kids are going to grow up one day. And when they're teenagers, they're going to be like, yo, Auntie Brittany has been married this whole fucking time. Yes. And they're going to be like, what the fuck is happening? And then they're going to question him and they're going to question their religion and they're going to question. And then he's going to blame me, you know, in like a joking way for like the kids becoming atheists. But like, you you know, he's going to he explains it to them to the best of his ability. Like we're Catholic. So unless they're married under the Catholic Church, it's not a marriage unless they're religious, unless they're doing something else. But because I was raised Catholic and I'm confirmed, I'm always Catholic. Mm. So the fact that I see my partner, though, born in a Catholic uh, country, wasn't catholic raised because most of the croatians by second world war ii i guess deviated from the church a large section Mm. of them so his family was one of those families so by the time he came around catholic was just like an aesthetic yes yes so he so they do you ever oh this is so confusing it's like okay according to their religion this is their belief and i'll respect it but obviously it seems silly to me because we're obviously married yes But that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's a choice every day not to end that friendship because my pride isn't wounded. My religion or my my religion, my atheism or my like lack of religion isn't threatened by my brother's religiosity. Yes. So it's kind of like when people have this ideal family gathering, it's like a family. Look, look, girl, I used to dream that my siblings and I would own a cul-de-sac and all of us would buy the houses next to each other. But it would never work because like we don't have the same beliefs and they would they cause rifts. They cause fights. They do. Our family is very like we have I grew up with parents that would sit at the table and talk about how much like gay marriage is gross and ruining the world. Well, their three gay kids are sitting at the table being like, pass the chicken. Like we're like, yep, like, damn, them gays, though. And like that's a, that takes a tolerance that I don't think the world is built for. So like I love these yes. progressives and some of them have it. Some of them have a tolerance that's beautiful. But like it takes a lot of tolerance to sit at family dinner and hear your family talk shit while you like ask them to pass the chicken. And I have it, but even I have limitations. I live a continent away. But I call my mom as frequently as possible. So I love my family, but I don't want to live near them. Yes. So again, this mythos around this amazing group of people that will love you unconditionally and want to see you every Saturday and never talk shit about your lifestyle. You got six friends that are clones of you? Because my friends are diverse. And Mm -hmm. we would all get on each other's nerves. Mm -hmm. That's why we live in different places. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. No, I, I, I do like, I agree with you, like sort of what you're saying and like on an intellectual level, this makes absolute sense to me. Yeah. This is like, yes, this is like exactly it. But then like I go into myself and like my emotions and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, I yearn for that sense of like mm. that family, that community, that everything, that everything is like a Christmas card basically. Mm. And like, I know just based on my own experiences, based on just everything around me, based on how absolutely terrible everybody's Christmases are because suddenly they have to play happy family and that just is not it. And they have to pretend to be something that they're not Mm. because if they don't, then fear, shame, everything is just terrible. Like I know that that's not how the world is and I know that that isn't what is actually making us happy and I know that's not what would make me happy either. Um... But it is just that, I think, not just that emotion, that emotionality within me, but also that 
that like lack that real severe lack of confidence that I have that like lack of sort of my own identity and knowing who I am and knowing like my I wouldn't say I guess in a way sort of like my values in and of myself as well sort of having that like core belief that really like sort of makes up the pillar of who I am um and so I think that's really difficult because it's all well and good and like sort of what I think about logically and objectively, like it, it makes perfect sense. But then I don't act on that at all because yeah. I'm afraid, I think. Yeah, yeah, I am afraid. Yeah. Is fear the loudest emotion you're feeling? Yeah, I think fear of rejection, definitely. Definitely. That fear of rejection is really visceral within me. Definitely. Definitely. I uh I brought this up on my review of you and I asked if you were pre-rejecting yourself and I wonder how you felt about that. I think to an extent, yes, I do pre-reject myself, but I think that it does come from a place of being a realist and not being a doomerist. I don't think I'm doomeristic about things. I think that I do go into situations with caution but that doesn't prevent me from going into spaces like I'll go speed dating and like I'll do the whole thing of being like confident and pleasant and perfume and makeup and everything and looking good and being sociable and everything but I'm realistic about the outcomes and like 99.9% .9 of the time it's it's proven to be the case the outcome that I thought it would be anyway so <sighs> I do think to an extent there is probably like an element of myself that sort of pre -re like pre rejects mm. um, and sort of like knows the outcome of things. But I think I'm very attuned to like analyzing my situation and like the world around me. So I sort of know how I fit into that. And so I don't become terribly optimistic about that. Yeah, yeah. And I do feel that that would change in different situations, different circumstances. Like, I think my dating prospects in South Africa would be far better than in the UK, for instance. But I at the same time, no women, it would be... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I was saying. At the same time, that would be, like, with men, right? Okay. Um, but in South Africa, I'd probably just... Based on where I lived in South Africa, I'd probably only be able to, like, be with a man, like, realistically. Like, yeah, um, even though you're a lesbian, in, in so you'd world. be, like, internally tortured every day. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Which wouldn't yeah, be good. Know actually like when I really think about it but yeah okay. so yeah I think to an extent I do but I don't think it's like sort of unfounded I don't think it comes from I guess the same kind of like doomerous place that it does for like your very vocally online insult mm. say where I don't even like try because I already allegedly know the answer like, I'm perfectly willing, like, I'll go out every single week into, like, the major cities in the UK. I'll go and I'll meet people. I will engage with and tolerate the most progressive things that I have absolutely no concern for. I will, I'll do all of that. But I'm realistic about that. And I'm realistic about sort of the outcomes of that, mm. I think. Okay, can I say if something? Again, it's going to sound a little, like, critical. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is this um, trope on the internet, especially on Discord. Uh, no, not Discord, Reddit. That's like, I'm a realist. I'm a realist. I'm a realist. And I can't tell if you're fitting into the trope or you're not. But it the only thing that's missing is the attitude of the outcome. So I think you're right. I think you're smart and observant and you are absolutely observing real things that are happening. Every story you've told, I'm like, oh, I, mm -hmm, I know that bubble. I know that. Exper yep. Mm -hmm. Real experiences, all of them. But the only difference between the realist who's just like, yep, I knew it. And oh, OK, cool. Is like the sense of peace versus like that negative word. I feel like you're somewhere in the middle where you're not as negative as the incel, but you're not at peace with it either. And I think it coincides with that Christmas, that desire to be like that Christmas card is like, mm -hmm. I know this is how the world is, but I still want it to be this other way, maybe. And don't get me wrong. People do have like families to get along with and people they have Christmas with and it's great and wonderful my childhood was that 
until politics gone the way and family differences. And then I don't see my cousins as much unless we're adults and we make that decision. Right. Mm. So I think you do have that for a while in life when everyone's on the same page. But if you want diversity of friends, it does mean not sharing the same desire for what Christmas looks like or what life looks like. Right. So unless all your friends are the same and you all believe the same thing, you're going to want to do different things for Christmas. So the realist in a philosophy sense, like the Zen, realism would mean, mean like humans are going to human, people are people, this is beautiful, look how wonderful life is. It happened exactly the way it should. And then the realist on Reddit is like, see, I told you, like humans do this and this is just what humans do. Which, which where are you on that spectrum of like humans just do what humans are going to do and like, oh, it went perfectly. Like you predicting things should be an awesome thing. Is it awesome? No, I don't find it awesome. Where, tell Not me because I'm that. on Reddit, though. I, oh, okay, I, don't, okay, I, don't, okay. I don't spend as much time on Reddit. As okay, we won't talk think. shit on like, Reddit today, guys. Okay, okay. <laughs> like, when I'm on Reddit, I'm mainly on, like, the subreddit of, like, Dostoevsky, okay? okay like, I'm just, that, like, comparing that. translations. Like, that's, sure, that's sure, sure, sure. sort of, like, the main thing I take seriously. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I'm sort of... My predictions, <sighs> yeah, my projections don't sort of represent something that I'm happy about. Like, I'm not happy when sort of what I predict actually happens exactly. Because oftentimes it's sort of things that have to do with especially my sense of self-worth. Mm. And so it just feeds that already very, I would say, in myself quite negative quite sad woe is me part and it just like reinforces that i would say so yeah yeah i, d I don't see it as i don't see realism as necessarily something that i i haven't really seen realism as being associated with sort of positive connotations in that sense of sort of i've made a prediction about the world humans are going to human beyond that of your bubble which tends to see it in that way but i do sense that a lot of that comes from the fact that like sort of in i mean not the fact but what i see in your bubble of people who are very sort of open to the realities of like mental health of like finding out things about themselves and their mental well-being and their mental diagnoses and sort of seeing that as like knowing more about themselves is a good thing yeah uh, whereas I don't see that. I don't see knowing more about myself as a good thing. The more I know about myself, the less I like myself and the less I want to know about myself. And that's why I avoid knowing myself. And I think that that sort of, that, I guess, positivity or that sort of um, affirmative association with oneself and knowing oneself, I do see that as being like rooted in sort of having those positive or good or really meaningful influences from other people in your lives. Like I see in like, when I read like your comment section, a lot of people talk about having partners and like talk about the different idiosyncrasies of like their relationships with their partners and having that person. And I think like, that's so important to like really affirming like this curiosity that you have in yourself and of yourself and the world in which you live and sort of Having somebody, I think there's somebody in your chat who, I'm not sure if it's, um, I think it's Brett, I'm not sure. Somebody in your chat, I, I like how they have like two separate apartments in the same building, mm, that they yeah, have like yeah. an apartment. I think them and their partner have like just two apartments in the same building and like make it work in like a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. And that like fascinates me because that's so different to everything that I sort of believe. But it's also like it represents to me like these two people really know themselves and each other and are really like curious about that sort of thing and have the confidence to be curious mm -hmm. and to be open and to be honest about what they want, what they need, about the life that they want to live together. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that. I'm really not at that point at all. And I think that's why sort of my realism is not about sort of curiosity with the intent of sort of being happy with myself and being at one with myself it's really sort of steeped in that sort of i think negativity yeah if that makes sense yeah like i've i've uh i struggle with that like idea of um 
realism like being I feel like anything but realistic mm -hmm. because I feel like realistically those people have those partnerships because they know themselves mm -hmm. so when people like they are not settling they're finding their soulmates I think like if I if like if I remember that story correctly like that's how I viewed it so that meant they found somebody who could vibe with them. But like if they had settled, maybe somebody would have like that would have like I like Robert B. Parker is my favorite male author. He's dead now. God bless him. But like Robert B. Parker and his wife were married for like 40 years and they started having fights and they have two grown sons and they're like, oh, my God, are we getting divorced? What the fuck? Like he writes these beautiful stories and there's a love story, like a love relationship in the story. And like I'm like, they can't get divorced. Well, they realized they didn't need a divorce. They needed a duplex. And so they got a duplex and she got one and he got the other and they were neighbors, but they lived together and slept together, but they needed their own fucking space. And mm. the romantic story in his novels, they actually live in two different places and they meet at each other's apartments. And this was like in the seventies, this started, I think he started writing in the seventies maybe. So mm. it's an older author who's writing great representation, great female leads, great strong women, educated men, all these things, blah, blah, blah. And, um, they live their whole life together till they died. And I remember reading that as like a 15 year old and it blowing, like bursting a bubble within me where I was like, oh, I can have anything I want. But wait, what's the limitation to anything I want? Because that was so unorthodox to me. That was like so beyond my comprehension of what you could have. Then I was like, well, what else could I have? And then that's, you said it earlier in the conversation. I want to talk about it. I do think you need other people to discover things about themselves so you can discover things about yourself. I think that's why I like being a YouTuber. Is I feel like I'm just like giving people tools and I'm like, hey, do you want to discover something about yourself? Use my tool. Did it work? No? Fuck. This one. No? Come on. This one? I got nothing. You have to watch somebody else. It's like mm -hmm. all of us, you included, have something in you that, that I'm going to learn something about myself through. Like you're, I'm going to learn myself through you. So it's like, okay, yeah. cool. It's like, what did you do with your life? I don't like that. I don't like that. Oh, I really like this though. I'm going to use that. And that's it. That's all we're doing. And then we're figuring it out. So like, you know how you're self-aware? Like you literally just said to me what your, what your, what your thing is, what your like, your challenge of life is. Mm -hmm. It's you. But like, you know what it is too. Like you're describing it to me. Mm -hmm. What's it like to be self-aware? And to know you're not where like you're going to be, but to, like, what's it like being self-aware and then knowing like you're the thing that's blocking you? What does that feel like? What is it like? Tell me, if you don't mind. Yeah, it feels very, I feel like so stunted. Like I feel really stunted in myself and like I don't know where I'm going and I, I it's like, is, is this the end? Is this just like my fate? And I think that that is, um, that's really sort of, that is definitely like my lived feeling. I feel very sort of, I think that's also where a lot of my loneliness stems from as well. Um, a, a lot of that sense of being like really like alone within myself and sort of not being understood or seen. Um, it really sort of like, I think stems primarily from that and then sort of shows itself in different ways. But I think that's why for me sort of having like hope and faith and patience has always been like, those are like the three things like right now that are just so important to me. Mm because it's sort of like the only thing I have and it's the only thing I have that there's no reassurance that I'm going to sort of get beyond it or like push forward from that but it's all I have and I think there is sort of because of that sort of I guess um I wouldn't say superhuman but I guess like sort of that like religious tinge to it mm -hmm. that it sort of seems like I, I can I can somewhat believe in it to like sort of move from day to day um even if realistically i'm like i'm a realist and so there's like no hope there's no faith mm. don't be patient because the world isn't going to change much but i do think that there is something within me and this sort of leads to sort of me feeding off other people and sort of a lot of the i guess the competition within me mm. that sort of does move me inch by inch forward from that but at the same time it doesn't address that real sort of sense of stuntedness within me that sort of just that stays that sense of stuntedness stays 
even if my life changes. So even though my life changed from when I was working in a grocery store to becoming a YouTuber, I still didn't lose that, that, that sort of sense of stuntedness of like not knowing what I'm doing or not being taken seriously or being an outsider or being like completely like unrelationshipable. Um, that didn't change and hasn't changed whatsoever. And there is a frustration in that sort of my life is changing, but I'm not changing. And my feelings about myself and my self-worth and confidence and everything isn't changing at all. And so I don't really know what I'm doing exactly. Like, is this sort of my fate? And am I just doomed to be like in the sense of being stunted in who I am? And especially in not knowing who I am. And will I ever know who I am if it's just me? And that's why I think there's just so much dependence on this significant other that I have in my mind. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, first of all, people always ask me, like, what do you mean, like, people don't change even if life changes around them? You just explained it perfectly. Your life can change, but you're not changing. Mm -hmm. And then you said something earlier that was another key. It's like, you're literally so self-aware it hurts like sometimes because like I'm just like but then there's like this unchangingness that's happening where you said like you didn't want to face yourself because you were afraid and that's why I say introspection is hard so like what is because what a great foundation Z to have like patience hope and faith like that's a great fucking foundation of values and of life like that's a good I patience is I will work on it for the rest of my life girl like that is a great fucking trinity right there. So what is actually, and don't answer it if you don't want to, stopping you from facing yourself when you know you desire so deeply to change and you know you could, but are you unsure of the tool? Like, what is it? Like, why not? Is it the timing? Are we not ready? I'm unsure of the tools, I think. I think I also get lazy in sort of, I think there's sort of, there is a comfort that I do find in sort of being like, I wouldn't say in being stunted, mm. but in sort of having things affirm that stuntedness. For sure. Because that's what I know. And mm. so like in the same way that, you know, somebody like feels that they know the world based on like their religious ideas of the world, there's like a comfort in that and not being challenged in that mm. because then everything unravels. And sort of, I guess the sense of stuntedness is the only thing I have. So I'm going to like hold on to it um, with a great deal more force than like letting go of it. Cause if I let go of it, then potentially I'll have like absolutely nothing. For sure. And then like, what will I do then? That's why I find that sort of like when I'm, when I don't feel stunted, it's because I've latched on to another person and I'm no longer latching on to sort of this pillar of stuntedness within me. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's sort of just like how I've coped from being a child. I think I always knew that when I was being looked after by someone, that it was always conditional, that I was sort of latching onto them, but it was conditional and that I was, to an extent I wasn't good enough because I wasn't their race, that they'd always prioritize their biological children over me. And that if I wasn't the ideal child for them then they wouldn't want me um and that belief would often be confirmed because they would leave or they would die in the case of my main uh, guardian and so it, it it always felt like sort of there was like sort of no other hope or no other sort of meaning beyond that that I could really find like solace in and sort of finding it in myself, but then finding that in myself, I didn't have anything because I was quite hollow because all of my identity was contingent on trying to be the perfect white girl and knowing that I wasn't the perfect black girl. But then inevitably, I'm never the perfect white girl because I'm black. And so what am I doing? Not being the perfect Christian, losing my faith in everything. And so it was sort of like all of that just like sort of left this void in a sense that is I guess sort of what I would call my stuntedness that I've now latched onto and sort of find like security in because that's always right it's always proved itself right it's always been validated it always predicts everything correctly everything that I think like you know you're not attractive enough 
um people may find you attractive but it's only because of like you know your fake lashes or your fake this or whatever you know all these different sort of things it's just all like sort of becomes this like hardened like ball of cement within me that I can then like cling on to and that's like that's my thing um even though it's not a thing that's good uh it's my thing and it's the one thing I have it's the one constant that I have so I think yeah I think that that's sort of why I have that mindset and why I can be sort of I think analytical about things and self-aware of that without going beyond that. Yeah. Um, because I also don't have anything to lose because I don't sort of have a belief system that I'm trying to like protect or um, maintain the integrity of. Like if I sort of, it's like sort of like being a Christian and saying, well, you know, I don't believe in God, you know, like I've got nothing to protect. Like I've got no like community that I have to sort of like think of exactly. Um, there's no like, stakes beyond that of just me and in my opinion i'm low stakes so it doesn't matter if that makes sense yeah can i um hmm. how are you doing on spoons uh i'm okay yeah i'm i'm, I'm okay Do not too bad uh, yeah maybe a bathroom break okay yeah yeah, yeah. okay let's do that let's take a, a break be back in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, and I really appreciate the way this conversation is going. They're loving it. It actually, I'm about, okay, so I'm going to go into a new section with you, but I just want to like, again, once again, you're doing good. You're good on spoons. I'm not like pressuring you or anything. Not at all. Not okay. at all. Okay. Okay. I really, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, ever, good. If, Please yeah. do. And I appreciate your vulnerability because I don't know if this feels very vulnerable to you, but either way, I do feel like we're talking about very vulnerable things. Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And thank you for creating this space. For me to be vulnerable in my so pleasure thank you. girl thank i feel you. i feel honored because I'm, I'm about to do it again in a this might be even more vulnerable so just like stop me if it is okay um you know first of all i am i don't know what it is but when you talk about your inner thought process and your life i am just like enthralled i am like hooked i'm like oh this is the best like story I've ever heard because it's just so real and vulnerable and I'm actually for the first time in and in outside of your content I feel like I'm hearing the voice of Z that is that is apolitical that is not who is like the in-between of the person that is perceived through her content if that makes sense like I feel like to correct me if I'm wrong but when the community calls you the C word I assume it triggers like that little girl in you that always felt like she wasn't good enough. And it does mm. probably fucking hurt a lot to hear from the community that shares your skin color and therefore should see your humanity and then can't and then has the audacity to ask white people to see their humanity. I'm like, you can't even see a black girl's humanity and you want white exactly. people to see yours. Mm -hmm. That's fucking rough, bro. Definitely, definitely. Like it, 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 it gets to me like a lot. Like really, really does get to me. Like it. Oh gosh, yeah. I get like fumes. <laughs> Just yeah. like it really, really does get to me. Yes, and I, I do see it as like very, very much associated with like sort of being a child mm. in South Africa and like having my whole life. Like I think I've, I've probably said this before somewhere, but like. It was never black people who wanted to like look after me. It was never black people who wanted to foster me, wanted to adopt me, like none of that whatsoever. Like to them, I was just like scabies. Like it was just like, and that was like the thing that really like sat with me like all the time through like my childhood. And then I got to adulthood and was in the UK and like discovered the internet like in my, when I was about 18. And I thought, wow, like, this is a whole world where, like, finally, you know, I'll see all these black people all over the world who are going to, you know, accept me and, like, it's all the diversity of it. And it was just, no, no, yeah. it, it, it was, like, the same thing, just different accents. And, um, yeah, yeah, I think that was, like, sort of very soul-crushing uh, for me and sort of going to university as well and having that exact same thing with the exact same 
sort of just thing just happening but in real life yeah. and it was like wow gosh so yeah. this isn't just a south african thing this is like a, a thing in the world and not just people mm -hmm. uh so yeah yeah now i'm curious bef before we took the break you were explaining like okay can we talk about my levels yes we can <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I feel like, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to project this onto you, but I feel like when you're explaining facing yourself and saying, like, I, I do feel like at least I know what I'm dealing with, like, in this, um, like, stagnation, and instead of going forward, I feel like you so perfectly explained, like, what I think a three is, because mm -hmm. you're on this bridge, and you're, like, and I feel like, not that I'm leveling you here, like, I feel like that's what it's going to sound like. But you are perfectly describing what I think the sensation of a three is going through, which is sort of like, why the fuck am I not fitting into these bubbles? And then some mm -hmm. of them go back. Like I have a friend who went back to the two bubbles. He's like, eh, I'm going to be a two, bro. I could go to a four, but honestly, I'm vibing. And I was like, have fun, bro. But you're not vibing. And so when you're mm -hmm. not vibing and you're a three, I think you have to make very big decisions. And the thing that is going to be your hurdle is yourself, but also the comfort of knowing at least the stagnation here is something that I know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the more and more I hear you talk, the more I'm not sensing like what bubble I would push you into, which tells me there isn't a bubble for you, which tells me like great news, you get to make your own. Bad news, you have to face yourself to do it. Yeah. Good news, you're more than capable. But you don't have to. Like you're not obligated to. Who the fuck cares if you break or pop the bubbles and like go over the bridge and hit four or five like who f who cares right it's a construct that I made it up okay I pulled it out of my butt but at the same time you are literally going through like a lived experience in front of me of what I would say like that's a three but not mm -hmm. literally because I don't know your inner workings and I would say like this is what I would tell Z to do to like pop it and be a four but then some people think four is harder than three I think your four is going to be easier than your three your three is really yeah i think so i think you're gonna hit four and it'd probably be easier mm. than your three is because your three seems pretty intense but i think you have so much baggage in the three bubble that your four is gonna feel so light interesting i think very interesting i could be wrong i'm not leveling you jesus christ i feel like i'm i'm doing it though a little bit but i i mean to say like whatever this thing i feel like i've seen people and i've experienced myself I look at your journey and I think like, okay, dope. Like she needs to pop this major bubble, which is herself, of course, because it's introspective, it's an introspection journey. But she doesn't have to. Like you literally don't have to. You can just like do this for the rest of your life. You're successful. You're pretty. You have a life. You have a community. You have a job. You don't have to. But if you do... I do think it will look like facing yourself. And I, if I was to tell you, could I tell you what prescription or what I would tell you to do to start yes. the journey? Okay. Like you fully consent. Like, okay. Fully. Okay. I would once a week, literally in the silence of your home, completely undress, not like naked, but like I would get to the state of realness, the real you, whatever that is. Like you told me you wouldn't wear makeup unless it was because of people. So mm -hmm. if the whole world was dead and it was just you, I want you to live that existence out for like one day a week, for like a month. Okay. And see what that's like. If if that's possible. I, I know we make our own schedules, but I know like it's hard for me to take a whole week, a whole day off just to do whatever I want. But if you did that, if you took one day off or maybe every two weeks, like don't, you know, I would see what that's like. And then I would keep note of it somewhere. So I make bullet points in my journals more than like full paragraphs. And I would just bullet point like this is how I felt when I woke up. This is how I felt in the afternoon. This is how I felt going to bed. And then I would just see where I'm at after four weeks and see if I see any changes, any positive, negative, see if I'm crying more, see if I'm anxious yeah. more or at peace more, see if I can look in the mirror more. I remember when... My friend and I were writing the levels. I know a lot of people try to guess like who he is. He's never been on my YouTube channel. Like you guys have never heard of him or seen him. But when we were doing it together, um, it was a fun journey. It took like, you know, a few weeks, whatever. We sat down, like we're talking about our lives. But one of mm -hmm. those nights, uh, we dropped acid for funsies and it was great. It was mm -hmm. a great experience. 
And he was like, hey, I heard that you're not supposed to look at yourself in the mirror when you drop acid. I was like, why? And he's like, because people are afraid of what they see. And I was like, let's go look at ourselves. So we both went into the bathroom separate points and like looked at ourselves in the mirror. And I was like, I don't see anything different. So then I Googled, like, why do people say not to look at yourself when you drop acid? Apparently, it's because people never look at themselves. So when you look at yourself on acid, you start to see all the acne scars and the colors of your eyes and like the details of your face. And you start to look like very real to yourself. But because Mm. he and I on our own separate journeys had already done that so many times. Like I've examined every gap in my tooth, every single fucking gum in my mouth. I just look at it all day. I just look at my face all day. Like what is this thing, this flesh thing that I'm like holding my consciousness in? What is this machine? You know, that I didn't see anything new because I'd already done it. But then it Mm. popped a bubble for me. I was like, people don't look at themselves. And then you said something to me earlier where you're like, yeah, like mirrors are in the house. And I'm like, yeah. Oh. Okay. So we need to look at ourselves. And without, like, it's okay to have the desire to change the self. I mean, gosh, I have gaps in my teeth and I have like this nose. I look like an alligator. I get you guys. But ultimately, like, I think it's about going on that journey of like recognizing like this is you, but it also isn't you. Like you are not this body, Mm -hmm. but it is the body that's going to get you through life. Yes. And that's it. Like this is it, baby. But I think that that's what I would tell you to do. And I do think that that is going – not that that one one thing is going to change or pop your bubble to four, but I think that that is going to be – the beginning journey to you doing exactly what you told me throughout this whole call, which is like facing yourself and going to that unknown. That's why I say like it feels scary and most people choose to be twos because to go over that bridge to say like I'm going to shatter all of it and go into another layer of unknown feels like the scariest thing in the world because you just don't know what's there. Mm. But I think what's there is ultimately – the only path you could have gone on anyways, like I think people who are like destined or whatever to be two stay twos and people who need more do more. But ultimately you're always doing what you need, which is why I kind of believe in Robert's work of determinism because I think like our biology and our genetics paint those pictures for us as well. Hmm. And the question is, is Z going to go over the bridge or is Z going to settle into the bubble she finds? But as you've talked to me for hours, I just cannot envision the bubble you're going into. Do you think, as we've talked, there's a bubble that's come into your mind where you've said, oh, maybe I'll settle into that bubble? No. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think that's sort of really something that makes me feel sort of lonely and sort of quite, like, desolate about everything. Like, I just feel like sort of... That's, like, the thing, I guess, sort of in what I see as like successful life or I see of people living. That's sort of what I want. Like sort of being a two, like that is like sort of, that was what I was when I was a child, very much so. Like when I was a Pentecostal, like that's what I was. I was like, definitely. And like, I was happy in that. Like I I sort of, I, I knew, I knew my life, you know, I knew like my life trajectory. I knew what my purpose was in that bubble and that made perfect sense like it was I didn't question anything you know it all made sense you know God made Adam and Eve not Adam and Steve like you know (laughs) didn't know what that meant but it made perfect sense it just made sense Mm -hmm. and it was just that was the bubble that was the life Mm -hmm. so I think yeah I, I don't see I don't see a bubble I don't see any bubble that sort of would give me that sense of I guess inner fulfillment and inner peace Mm -hmm. that it has already been sort of established and already has its boundaries and its value system its rules its people its identity Mm -hmm. um yeah I don't see that I really don't see that no okay can I make a prediction Mm -hmm. okay so again like I'm just an idiot on the internet but if I was to make a prediction about your life I would say The reason you said now the current person you are is probably not the person you'll be with and you gave yourself a 10-year travel, like a 10-year adventure. Somewhere Mm -hmm. within 10 years, I do think you'll – if I had to make a bet, I would say you're probably going to go to four and then between four and five, 
you're going to meet that person, maybe, no promises, but that mm-hmm. person is going to be a four or a five. And if you guys met now, you wouldn't like each other. And if you met now, you wouldn't be each other's soulmates. But you'll meet somebody mm-hmm. along the way who's already done this work, who's doing it right now, who can't date you right now because they're either trapped in the bubble and they're breaking out of it themselves or they're going on their own like queer journey themselves because like you're going to end up with a woman and that yeah. woman is probably battling her own version of fucking internalized homophobia or racism. Who knows if she's black or Asian or whatever the fuck she is, you know, but she's going to have her own journey. And you're not going to end up with some two who's like stuck in a bubble. I don't I know you said like, oh, they could be as conservative or progressive or as whatever. But like. I just think you're going to come home every day to somebody that you're going to look at and be like, what the fuck? Like, you're not going to have like (laughs) deeply profound conversations with somebody who's fucking like in a bubble you don't live in as well. Okay, that's my prediction. No guarantee you'll meet her, but if you did meet her, I think. I think that 10 year gap is probably you probably know yourself well enough to know it's going to take a while because this yeah. this shit takes a while. Like I said, I feel like I became like I went through my journey at 30 and I feel like four years, five years later, I'm still like what I call a baby five. <laughs> I feel like I'm middle five, maybe at most, but I feel like I'm a baby. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like I'm still figuring it out and like who I am. And I think it takes a long time because like life's going to throw so many things at your way. Look at me like, am I autistic? And I'm like, <laughs> Jesus, like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> and maybe I am. Who the fuck knows, bro? But it is one of those things where like, fuck, if I'm autistic, I'm just about to start that journey. I'm about to start the mm-hmm. ADHD journey, whatever it is, bro. I just started the fibro journey, you know? And so again, I, I think that that's my prediction for your life, but I don't know. What do you think about that? far more viable prediction of my life than I have for my life and I think having somebody else say that and somebody else sort of see that prediction a prediction that sort of has a lot more a lot more optimism in it even though it's not like sort of like the optimism like it's not like sort of unrealistic optimism like you know there's no guarantees of anything Mm -hmm. but sort of having somebody see that in me something that I don't see in myself I think that's very that's very helpful as something that I can like sort of remember and reference and I think that's sort of I guess the it has that sort of propelling force for me that sort of having my ex-guardian say oh you'll never get into Oxbridge like it sort of has that that same sort of that that same sort of tinge to it for me um that unlike that, I appreciate, Mm. um, I do appreciate that. And I think that is sort of the future that I would want and that I, I can really see myself finding happiness in that isn't necessarily a happiness or fulfillment or not necessarily happiness, but like a a joy in Mm. a, a joy sort of of life and of myself. That is sort of like the first assessment that sort of doesn't isn't contingent on like another person exactly like that's just a a part of it potentially Mm -hmm. if that is to happen so yeah yes that that is a far more that is definitely far more viable a future that i wouldn't see for myself that i haven't sort of had the i think capabilities of seeing for myself it's interesting yeah, does it make you like feel a certain way or does are you just digesting? I think right now it feels too good to be true. Sure. I think it, it, it feels that way. But also it doesn't feel it feels too good to be true, but not in so much that it like couldn't viably happen. Um Yeah, like, I guess, like, making a million dollars seems too good to be true. But, like, it isn't sort of, you know, I can make, like, $100,000. Like, that's sort of, like, the same sort of, like, trajectory, I guess. So it's sort of, I think it has that feeling for me. Um, Yeah. But I do recognize that sort of getting there is going to, that's going to require sort of me and finding, I guess, that, that sort of confidence in me. 
And I'm not sure how to do that, but I do know that that needs to happen for that to happen. That sort of future that you sort of painted that looks like a future that I can actually find a sense of home in mm -hmm. and a sense of joy in that I can't in my current state and in my current mindset and in my current sort of situation within myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I actually think like when you first originally mentioned the 10 years of finding a partner, I was like, damn. But then I realized that would put you at your mid thirties, right? Yeah. 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 Yes. So like, honestly, vibes. Mm -hmm. Vibes. Like it sounds like a long time, but to be honest with you, like, Things take time, especially yeah. the introspection journey. So it doesn't just like, you know how you can like, you're so like, lo like you can like literally tell me right now, you voiced everything. And I just like held up a mirror and I was like, you already know what to do. But it's a matter of like, it's so easy to tell our brains, like I this relating this to like minor divergency. Like if I'm exhausted and I'll tell my brain like, do this, please do this. And my body's just like, not going to do it. My brain's like not doing it. And I was like, what is happening? It's like, we know what to do. Why can't I do it? What's yes. happening? And it's, it feels like that. And I think things happen. That's the moment where I give myself grace. And I said, okay, bitch, you've already tried everything. We're not doing it. Apparently we are going to accept we're not doing it now. And then I'm like, what do you mean? We're not doing it right now. And it feels like I'm battling with myself because I am. And it's mm -hmm. like, now we are going to work on accepting that we're not doing it today. And so it's just like, what the fuck just happened? Like, I'm not even exaggerating the fight I had with food today was amazing over texture sensitivity I'm so frustrated I slaved over this pasta dish for hours last night today I was stoked all the whole process I sat down to eat it Z I ate like five or so bites and I was like I started to like question myself and my partner was watching me eat he's like what's wrong and I was like I can't eat this. And he's like, why is like, it tastes perfect, but the texture is off and nope. Now I'm getting grossed out by my own food. And I pushed it away from me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to eat today. Am I? And I was like, no, I love to eat. We have to eat today. And I can't, nothing is right. He bought me croissants. Cause he knows I love croissants. I couldn't like, I just, I don't want them. And like, I tried to eat today and I was like, every time I put food in my mouth, I just spit it back out like a baby, like a fucking baby. And I'm like, what is this? And it's like every food that touches my mouth right now feels really wrong. Mm. is it wrong no is that in any way reasonable no is it happening yes <laughs> so i have just accepted i have not really eaten today and i'm not hangry because unlike normal hangry which is like a normal human thing i'm experiencing a repulsion and the repulsion makes me not want to eat so therefore i'm not even hungry even though i know i'm hungry mm. i literally don't even desire food versus normal Brittany. She wants to eat every two hours. Yeah. Chat knows when Brittany goes to pee, she comes back with a snack. Have I brought yes. a snack back? I pee twice. No snacks. That is life. You're battling mm -hmm. yourself. And then on top of that, you got to deal with fucking people. Mm. Oh, yes. And that's just how it is, which is why I think people choose their bubbles because their bubbles give them a support system to go to when they're battling both. What mm. do you do when you don't have that? You make your own support system, but it's about you. You get a therapist that's about you. You get friends that are about you and about them. But you communities, communities are harder because you also have to be less you in a community. Yes. And it's usually worth it for most people. I have a prediction it's not worth it for you, but we don't know yet. No, I'd agree with that. It's, it's not worth it for me. It really isn't. I have tried every so you, often. You and it's just tried. not worth it. You have told so many community. You have bubble hopped so much. You have told this whole interview had made me realize like, oh, my girl has literally bubble hopped so much and she has not found it yet. Like mm -hmm. you have not, you have absolutely tried. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important because a lot of people don't even try. You have literally tried so hard that it's so weird. Like the irony. Okay. This is one of my theories. I think the most introspective people look from the outside like the people who have not tried at all, but have secretly tried the most. And I think the reason the two bubble can't contend with it is because they find it eventually after trying once or twice. But when you try more than that, they look at you like you're failing and you mm -hmm. are sort of failing the two bubble, but that's because it was never meant for you. Yes. 
And so I think right now I'm looking at you, at least after today, and I'm thinking, oh, no wonder she's fucking up in the two bubble, bro. She got to go to five, bro. Unless I'm wrong. And then the two bubble, there's going to be one I haven't heard about. But I can't think of one that you're going to vibe into. But that's, don't don't let me change your course. No, I completely agree with you. I do agree with you. That makes so much sense. Sort of like articulating that that feeling. Like that really, that resonates with how I feel. That mm. really does. Really, like well and truly it does. Yeah. I'm really glad. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Like a lot of sense. Like for the first time in a long time, like that actually like sort of, it's like when you like, it's like when you put your duvet on a bed cover and you like clip it at the bottom yeah. and it's just like, ah, yeah. There we go. That's the right. That resonates. Like that rings so true. That's yeah. great. That's mm -hmm. I could like again, I don't want to like feel like I'm tooting my own horn or anything, but I feel like I just like popped my own bubble about you where I'm like, "Oh. I feel like I'm seeing a different version of you that feels much more clear and much more like cuz I feel like the last time we spoke, I didn't I personally walked away from that interview feeling like feel lacking I feel like I wanted something different from that experience and I felt like I didn't see you in a way that I was thought I would have and I was like what did I do wrong or what it what happened and so I kind of let it go because I was like okay like it was what it was but this feels like what I thought that conversation was going to be yes does that does that does that do you completely feel there was a real there is a real breakthrough for me in this yeah. Like, I feel like, I feel like you're seeing me and I feel like I'm seeing you. And I feel like I'm also seeing the levels in a way that I can actually, it, it, it really like speaks to like my, my stuntedness, like that piece yeah. of cement in me. And it's like, yeah, this is like defining this. And this is also not just defining it and just being like, oh, well, this is defining it and being like, this is what you can do. And this is mm -hmm. what I predict you can do. And so, yeah, this, this feels like that sort of aha moment Yeah. that in our last conversation, I, I also didn't feel that it, it sort of, it was a nice conversation, sure. but it was like that, that was sort of like what it was. Yeah. Whereas yeah. this is like something that is going to like stick with me for like the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. this is something that's like really like spoken to me and to how I feel and sort of that sense of sort of perpetual loneliness that I felt and that like sort of rather like an optimistic realism that I have that is like this is what you can do and this is what you need to do as well and this is something that you can do as mm. well yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah there was um it okay this is also coincides with my theory on timing because that last conversation we had I think we needed to have it and I think time needed to go by and then this conversation was made possible. Mm. Like, I don't think we could have had that because I didn't have all the information. I feel like that last conversation we had gave me more insight into you, even though I left it feeling like more like unsure. Mm. It now makes so much more sense why we weren't having this moment then. It's like, well, we couldn't have. I didn't even have these tools. You hadn't made your lesbian video yet. Like you like you mm. had to go on your own nine month journey. Do you remember when we did that collab? When was it? Do you remember? I'm, I'm very tight, bad with timing, but I wonder how it coincided. That was a while ago. Yeah. That was a while ago. Like, I, I hadn't moved yet. I was still, like, living in my old place. Yeah, yeah that was a while ago. That was so, actually like, a real, a long, I, quite I a think while ago. that timing matters. I do, bro. And so, like, here you are in your own journey, the last nine months, medication, lesbianism, all this beautiful stuff. Like the, that conversation had to happen then so this one could happen now. And then you had to go on that journey. And we didn't talk for a long time. Mm. You know, we wished each other like yeah. Merry Christmas, I think. And then that was it. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so been like, a long time. Yeah. It's been mm. a, so like genuinely, the, I think like that's why I think timing is so important. And when and by the way, like I'm not expecting you to go home right now, strip naked and be like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like this. Now you could take. You could do this for the next four years. You could be slowly, you could do mascara first, wig first, clothing first, one thing. And you could do, like, you could take, it's not about doing it now. 
It's about taking your time, but like do it now. But like take your time. No rush. But like do it now. But like, you know what I mean? It's about those those two contradicting. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I think that's what's so important. Like there's that acknowledgement of like, you've got time, but do it now. So it's sort of like both, both, both parts of that, both yeah. sides of the coin are like sort of are validated and understood yeah. and are given exactly. their space. Exactly. And I think that's, that's really, that's what has been lacking for me. They're sort of like, it's like either or. They, they, and there's no acknowledgement of like sort of that, that, that contingency process and all of it. Like the time is now, but also like you've got time, Yeah. but it's now. Yeah. And I think that's really important. It's, yeah. I really think life is like these tiny contradictions. I really think life is this combination of everything happening at once. Like I always joke to my husband. I was like, man, our funeral was beautiful. He's like, what? I was like, it's already happened. Like, you know, we're already dead. We're already like old. Like I've already lived. I'm already 45. Like I was like, man, what a beautiful life we've had. And he's like, you don't even know what it's going to be. And I was like, we already had it. It's already done. So now there only is this time. Like the past has happened. The future's happened. Now I only have now. And now is, you know, I'm in my hustle era. But I'm also accepting that like, man, my neurodivergency might be cock blocking me in some ways. But also I'm I'm doing great. YouTube loves me right now. My AdSense is paying me more than it's ever paid me. Like life is going great. But at the same mm-hmm. time, like I'm more tired than I've ever been. But I'm also more successful. But I'm also more happy. And I'm also like all things at once. I'll accept it. And I think that practice, and I always say like introspection isn't a tool that like you get once and you're done. You have to keep it like active Mm -hmm. because it's so easy to drown in the loud, like the loud noises of like what everyone else is doing or like, I always get like feedback about my channel. I'm like, I was like, let me just like take my path as it comes. And whether I blow up tomorrow or never blow up, like if I can pay my rent, like I'm chilling, but that anxiety I have inside me always will be there of like. Are, am I competing good with the bubbles? Which is why I say like I don't want to compete with anyone but myself because I'm yeah. the only person who will let me compete in a way that is true to my joy. Yeah. Other people, they don't compete fairly. They compete dirty. And I don't want to do that to myself. But I understand. I understand like we do need other people to recognize the things in ourselves. Like we needed – like you're giving me a tool. I feel like I'm having a fucking epiphany right now, bro. Where I'm like, Jesus, like, this is beautiful, bro. Like, watching, like, you allowing me to have this opportunity is absolutely, like, I'm not going to take it for granted. Like, I understand how beautiful. And we're doing this in front of humans. And a part of me is like, I almost want to, like, shut them out and be like, girl. (laughs) (laughs) The great thing about this call, like, I I can't see the chat. So I'm like. I'm not, I'm avoiding, I'm trying to avoid it as much as possible. (laughs) I am. Because I almost want to be like, girl, what a beautiful moment, dude. Yeah. But it's important. I think it's also important for other people to see that because it's like, yeah. there may be somebody else there who feels the same Absolutely. as you or I about something. So I think, you know, yeah, yeah. yes. Does that, but I get, I get you. Did you, did you, is there anything? Well, I guess you could tell me in private, but like if there's anything you want to talk about in private, you let me know. But I, mm-hmm. I do appreciate you putting yourself out here and talking in front of people because I, I do think some people will hear it and be like, holy fuck, like this makes so much more sense. Or like, I just clicked or like, wait, I'm doing the same thing Z's doing. So many people in the comments really related to you. You have spoke, your lesbian coming out video spoke to so many people in your audience. I read those comments. Yeah. People really resonated with it. And same even in my audience. So like, no, I understand where she's coming from. And like, that was beautiful to see as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is why I think it's like, awesome that we've decided to make these videos but like that you put yourself out there even if you refuse to date anyone on the internet you know i i'm I'm not going to like it may change who knows it it may change it may change yeah but at this point in time i i don't see that as a possibility fair fair but who knows but who actually knows you know, like I say, future Brittany can worry about that. She's got it. She'll figure it out. It's not this Brittany, so not my problem. Yeah. So now exactly. we're we're coming to the point where I feel pretty damn satisfied with everything that we've talked about. But is there anything else on your mind? Is there anything else you wanted to go over? Anything? Because, like, I, I think I, I'm looking at my scribbles, and they're mostly scribbles of hearts. I mostly make hearts and stars when I scribble. <laughs> so I mostly made scribbles, but I, I think I talked about everything that my, that I had written down. 
Yeah, I think everything has been like this is the first time I've spoken to somebody online and I've actually felt like seen. Like every single facet of me has been seen. And I've been able to like actually like I came in and I was like shaking, like and I'm always shaking whenever I'm talking to somebody. And by the end of it, I'm still shaking and still nervous and my voice is still like cracking up a bit at the end of every sentence. But I, I for the first time I actually feel so still mm. and I'm like this is like somebody who's seen me and I I felt seen like in this whole conversation yeah. and that I can actually like speak. I can speak what I actually feel and also not have you like, just be like, Oh yes, queen, like to everything I'm saying, but actually say, you know, you need to figure your shit out, but also you've got time and also it's okay to feel this way, but you also, this is what you can do. And this is what you need to do. And this is what I see for you. And this is like how, I evaluate your situation and how you are. And I think that honesty has like been so important to me. So thank you so much. So I feel, I feel so good about this. Like really, really good. good. I'm yeah. quite stoic, so it may not show, but um, I feel really, like I feel very, very good about this. Like this is something, like I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is going to like change, like, and this is going to stay with me for like my life, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. No, I literally, I feel I'm hiding myself from the audience. I do feel <laughs> slightly emotional. Like, I feel like I might cry a little bit, but only because, like, I do feel like I'm finally seeing a part of you that I've so desperately, like, felt like I could see, but I couldn't see. And now I'm like, oh, my God, no. It just, like, came into, I feel like I just put on a pair of glasses and I didn't know I needed them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing, like, the full, like, at least what I could see even now, clearly. I'm sure there's so much more that I can't see. That is just like, oh, cool. Like, it's so much prettier than I even thought. And I thought it was pretty before. But, like, mm -hmm. you really are just, like, a beautiful consciousness. And so, like, it was so nice to, like, have this moment because it just, like, solidifies to my, my I think, attraction to your content. But then my, like, draw to, like, being, like, there's something in Z that I would just, like, love to understand more. So it feels awesome. Like, I'm not going to lie. I feel this is – could not have gone better. And I was quite nervous coming into this because – I genuinely was – I was just so worried about um, not upsetting you and I wrote that in the email to you. Like I just didn't want it to be a threat to our friendship or something and I was like, I hope she knows I mean well and I intend well and I think that's so hard in online spaces to convey that. So I just – I feel really grateful that you saw me as well and you gave me a space to like – have a criticism and then expand on that and then take it apart and put it back together. Like, I just don't think I, anyone else could have done that except you and me in this moment. And I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But I, I do have to say that I was never in doubt. Like even when I watched it the first time and I was like that bitch, I wasn't in doubt even in that. And I think the reason why I was like that bitch is because I knew that your intentions were good. Yeah. And I knew that, I knew that it didn't come from a place. And I think that's just a testament to your work, actually, and to, like, Thank you. everything that I see, that I wasn't ever in doubt about that. And I think that's what made me so angry at first. I was like, I can't actually be angry at this because this is, like, this is, this is like, what I want of, of people. And this is, she's not doing this, like, maliciously. Like, I, I can't, like, be angry about this. and But I want to be angry about this because this is so, like, exposing of, like, me and, like, everything that I feel inside of myself that I don't want to reckon with and that I don't want to yeah. see. And so, like, I had to deal with that. And I had to figure that out by, like, re-watching it a few times and being like, okay, like, this is a you thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a testament to, like, what you do more than anything else, Thank that you. even in, like, that moment of being, like all guns blazing that I was like I I, I had no doubt um thank of you. your intentions so yeah thank I you think, well, and I think that speaks to like your willingness to be introspective because I think it is so fucking hard and I'll say this as a youtuber myself to hear somebody make a video about you I don't think it gets easier it just gets like you react differently because of the relationship you're having with your observation and so I think that that literally when I got your email I was like <gasps> I felt like uh, and then I felt like kind of relieved you had reached out and then you were so warm in the email and I was like okay everything's fine everything's fine <laughs> like we're fine but yeah like it is I don't think it gets easier but I think you have a better relationship with it over time where it's less jarring to see mm -hmm. someone talk about you 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate I really, I do appreciate everything about our connection. And I'm just, yeah, I'm, this night could not have gone better. <laughs> yes. Completely agree. Really, completely agree. I didn't think it was going to go this well. Yeah, um, same. <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy. I'm relieved. I'm so relieved. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, now it's 1 a.m., uh, one thirteen my time. I think it's about probably the same year time, right? Yes. Just yeah. About... Yeah. Just quarter past midnight. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have dinner now, I think. Yeah. And I'll enjoy it, actually. Uh, yes, I hope you get your I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go enjoy that food, girl. Well, yes. okay. I will stay around and talk to my chat. but. Um, Thank you for being here and I can't wait for the next one. Thank you so much for having me. Seriously. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you my so pleasure. much. All right. Bye, Kelly. Talk to you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. In my head, in real life, while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but bled, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then